That's, oh, okay. Maggie. That's Maggie. So okay. I'll resend it. All right. We are live now, though. Okay, we'll uh, do introductions first. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee. And I'm Senator Jim Dill. I'm the Senate Chair. And we do have uh, six hearings to do today. So we'll get try to get started here right off quick. And we'll do introductions. Representative uh, Schofield. Good morning, Senator Dill. Good morning, everyone. I, uh, I'm Tom Schofield, and I represent House District 112. I live in the town of Weld. And I represent 17 towns and townships in Franklin and Somerset counties, the High Peaks region of May. Good morning. Good morning. Senator Black. Good morning, Senator Black from Wilton. I represent Senate District 17, which is all of Franklin County and four towns in Kennebec County. Representative Hall. Good morning, uh, Randy Hall, uh, representing District 114, uh, six towns in Southern Franklin County. Representative Landry. Uh, good morning, Representative Scott Landry. I am the last one you'll hear from in Franklin County today. Uh, I represent the towns of Farmington and New Sharon, District 113. Yeah, we got Franklin County out of the way. We can now move on. So, Representative Gifford. Yes, I'm in Penobscot County with you. And uh, I represent District 142. Thank you. Representative Bernard. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sue Bernard. I represent Caribou, Westmanland, and New Sweden in Aroostook County, also known as the Crown of Maine. The county. Senator Maxman. Hi there, I'm Chloe Maxman. I represent Senate District 13, which is all of Lincoln County, except for Jesden, plus Washington and Windsor. Representative Poker. Hi, I'm from House District 95, which is Warren, Hope, Appleton, and part of Union. Thanks for having me. House Chair O'Neill. Good morning. Um, my name is Maggie O'Neill, and I'm here representing House District 15, which is in Saco. Representative McRae. Yes, good morning, everybody. I'm the second of the representatives from the county, the Crown, and I live in Fort Fairfield, and I proudly represent the people of District 148. Representative Osher. We'll have to come back to her. Looks like she's having trouble connecting to audio by the, what I see. Um, with that, uh, I will introduce our clerk, which is Cheryl McGowan. And Cheryl will try to keep everything running smoothly for us this morning. And Karen Netto is our analyst. And uh, Karen uh, uh, helps us, uh, especially on work sessions, but also keeps us straight on what we're trying to do here. Um, from session to session and hearing to hearing. And as I mentioned, we do have uh, six hearings today. Uh, remember to keep yourself muted until you're ready to speak. Uh, only, uh, on the committee folks can ask questions and, uh, and talk when they're actually called upon by one of the chairs. And uh, what we will do is uh, the way the hearing will go, we will hear from the sponsor of the bill, followed by any other co-sponsors or legislators that wish to speak. And we'll move on to the department. Uh, and after the department, we'll have general testimony and we'll have three minutes each. So again, please keep yourself muted until you're ready to speak. And with that, uh, as I say, we'll also be, uh, unfortunately, we had no problems whatsoever, Representative O'Neill or I, on being the background police. But we do have to be on the lookout of what's in the background, other than white deer. Um, and we can go from there. So I will go back to Representative Osher. If you want to unmute yourself, introduce yourself, please, Representative. Hello, this is Laurie Osher. Hi, Laurie. I, I will be uh, able to be on video in about five or 10 minutes, but I am from District 123. That's most of Osher, excuse me, most of Orno, and uh, good morning to everyone. Good morning. And with that, we will start and go ahead and get right into our uh, public hearing. And I'll open up the public hearing on LD 519 
an act to protect, protect children from exposure to toxic chemical. And the person to present is Representative Gramlich. And I see her on our screen, so hopefully she can unmute herself and be on video and she can present her bill. Thank you, Senator. Pardon my getting up to speed with my technology here. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and my distinguished colleagues of the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. I am Lori Gramlich, and I represent House District 13, which is the lovely seaside community of Old Orchard Beach. I am pleased to present LD 519, an act to protect children from exposure to toxic chemicals. As some of you may recall, I introduced this bill during the 129th legislature, and it was voted uh, to pass as amended out of this committee, there were two um, ought to pass committee reports that was um, voted positively out of committee. But however, due to the pandemic, we unfortunately were not able to get this bill enacted into law last session. As a social worker and a lifelong advocate for children, my intent with LD519 is to protect children from toxic chemicals. By way of background, again, this is a perennial bill that has had uh, many different iterations coming before gone by. The legislature has made great strides to begin to address the use of pesticides within close proximity of our children, such as requiring schools to adopt integrated pest management policies and procedures and requiring application of these chemicals to be done by properly licensed personnel. While the state has adopted standards for pesticide application and public notification, there is still work to be done. Pesticides and herbicides are poisonous, not only for lawn pests and weeds, but also for people, pets, and our planet. The range of known harmful effects associated with human exposure to certain lawn care pesticides include cancer, asthma, reproductive problems, liver and kidney damage, and nervous and immune system disorders. Our children are especially vulnerable with their small and rapidly developing bodies. We know that exposure to pesticides put children at risk. The complex processes involved with the development of their brains and organ systems are uniquely susceptible to damage from pesticide exposure and make them particularly vulnerable. Ch childhood exposure to pesticides is associated with pediatric cancers, decreased cognitive function, ADHD, and other learning disabilities, birth defects, asthma, and behavioral problems. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, recognizing and reducing children's exposure to pesticides will require improved medical training, public health tracking, and regulatory approaches. Additionally, the World Health Organization has made a correlation between glyphosate and cancer. Of the 40 most commonly used pesticides in schools, 28 can cause cancer, 26 can adversely affect reproduction, 14 are linked to endocrine disruption, 26 are nervous system poisons, and 13 can cause birth defects. Many others have been shown, as I've mentioned, to increase rates of asthma, allergies, and other respiratory issues, and immune system disruption. The Toxins Action Center identifies that scientists are continually discovering new and disturbing ways that pesticides threaten our environment and our children. Children whose bodies are developing are particularly at risk. Of those commonly used pesticides, glyphosate is the world's most used herbicide and the active ingredient in Roundup. Many school districts and cities in the United States have already discontinued the use of glyphosate. 18 other states have partial or outright bans in numerous municipalities, including Maine. According to the Maine Board of Pesticide Control, there are 29 municipalities in Maine that have ordinances restricting pesticide use. Some restrictions are very site specific, while others are very broad, such as full citywide bans is in Agunquit, Portland and South Portland, for example. Both the governors of Arkansas and Missouri have already banned certain herbicides, providing that uh, statewide action actually can be taken to protect citizens. It is important to note, as I've mentioned, that the intent of this bill would not impact our farmers, blueberry growers, or our potato industry. The scope of this legislation is really narrowly, narrowly defined with an emphasis on protecting children. 
the American Academy of Pediatrics has stated, children are most vulnerable to pesticides. Let's take action to protect the future of our state and our children. I urge you to vote ought to pass on LD519. And I and again want to reiterate and underscore that the committee did a, a great deal of work on this particular piece of legislation during the 129th. Um, or to working with you so that we can find solutions to address this issue. And I would be happy to try to answer any questions for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Representative McRae. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome to our committee, Ms. Representative Gramlich. Thank you, you, Representative uh, McRae. I remember this bill well. Uh, and I, my, my question is very simple. I, I, I supported it last time, but I wanna know, uh, has the amendment that, we, that was agreed upon last time before we passed it, been included in this version of the bill? That's a good question, Representative McRae. Um, and so when I was kind of sharpening my pencil and doing my homework on this bill for this time around. Um, I looked at both Committee Amendment A and Committee Amendment, Committee Amendment B that came out of um, this committee last time around. And my bill is modeled after Committee Amendment B which would ban the use of synthetic herbicides, including but not limited to glyphosate. Um, Committee Amendment A uh, was a report out for non-selective herbicides, which is a bit more broad. So um, I did opt to go with Committee Amendment B, which was a, a bit more specific and narrowly defined. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Rep. Graham, like, thank you for um, that comprehensive testimony. I'm wondering if you can go back through, um, since you said you based it on the previous reports, what were the votes last time around? And um, was it, was Amendment A the majority or how did it work? Uh, that's a, thanks for asking oh, sorry, analyst, that question. I put you on the spot. Uh, you know what, when I, I, I <laughs> it's funny that yes, that, cause I, when I looked at it, I, when I pulled the bill up from the 129th, I couldn't get, um, I couldn't find anyway, the list of votes. I think it was pretty close because it didn't have a majority or minority ought to pass out. It was just OTP as amended. And I was actually last night talking with um, one of the one of the lobbyists, one of the advocates, and uh, he too was trying to figure out what the vote was. Um, I think it was pretty close, but I don't recall. Thanks. Yeah, that's something we can find out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah, we can ask our analysts to have that for the work session, certainly. I think, um, Senator Dill, um, I think that you, as I recall, you were on the, re, um, the committee amendment B report um, as it was reported out uh, last session, which is what my bill is modeled after. Senator Maxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Gramlich. Um, I was just wondering in your, um, as you prepared for today and, and revived this bill, if there was any specific opposition that you wanted us to be aware of as we move forward in the hearing today. Thanks for that question, Senator Maxman. Um, I think that you're going to likely hear from the same um, folks that you, who were on the committee last session, heard from in terms of um, the industry uh, folks that are uh, working in long care and um, possibly folks that um, have land or property that, um, as Representative McCray brought up last session, within close proximity to schools and how that would be impacted. And as you may recall, we did a lot of work around that issue last time around. And so I tried to make sure that my bill was mindful of the points that the committee brought up during the 129th so that we could um, reach some consensus to get this one over the finish line this time around. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, would you be able to go through um, some of that history and, and kind of different accommodations and considerations that you incorporated? In terms, uh, Representative O'Neill, in terms of um, Proximity to, like, I know that Rosen McCray brought up last time around up in Aristic County, for example, there's quite a bit of um, land and space that abuts school schoolyard and school grounds and that type of thing. Um, I, I am not going to, I'll have to pull the bill up, but um, I can't, I can get that all for you for the work session. How about that? <laughs> 
That sounds perfect. Yeah, I remember that we had a lot of back and forth and a lot of work that went into it. So I think that would be helpful um, just to, you know, get everybody on the same page of all the work we did on that. Absolutely. Are there any other questions for the representative? Seeing none, thank you for your- Thank you, thank you, Senator. Right. Uh, next up is Megan Patterson from uh, um, Department of Agriculture, Conservation, Forestry, Board of Pesticides Control, followed by Andrew Hackman, Andrew King, and Don Flannery. And please make sure that when you um, testify to state your name, where you're from, and right up front, whether you're for or against or neither for or against the bill, so we make sure our list is correct. Thank you. So with that, Megan Pass. All right, good morning. So my name is Megan Patterson. I'm, um, <clears throat> I'll just say good morning, uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Megan Patterson. I'm the director of the Board of Pesticides Control, speaking on behalf of the board and the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, neither for nor against LD 519, an act to protect children from exposure to toxic, toxic chemicals. Uh, the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry is firmly committed to protecting people and the environment from pests and pesticides in all settings, especially in schools. The Board of Pesticides Control enforces state regulations specifically aimed at minimizing risks on school properties. The Department's School Integrated Pest Management Program, or I IPM program, provides guidance, technical resources, and training to schools, um, and specifically to their IPM coordinators. The program is intended to help schools find effective solutions to prevent and manage pests and remain in compliance with state and federal uh, pesticide regulations. And I did provide you a little bit of sort of a summary of what that relationship is between the schools and school IPM and the training that they uh, receive and those IPM coordinators. Um, and I believe Kathy Murray is going to speak later is going to speak even more in depth about that. So I did have some practical practical considerations that I guess I'd like you to consider, um, one, in, one being just a technical consideration with the language, it seems to say um, properties within 75 of, five feet of school grounds. Um, it's not clear in the bill that that pertains to school grounds as well. So I think that's, that's one clarification that's not listed in my testimony, but um, I guess in essence, this bill prohibits the use of synthetic herbicides, including but not limited to glyphosate within 75 feet of school grounds. Uh, the prohibition exempts agricultural land and residential property. The effective result of the prohibition leads to the following observations and considerations. By prohibiting applications of synthetic herbicides within 75 feet of school grounds, except in limited circumstances, this bill will effectively prohibit pesticide applications by trained and licensed commercial applicators on property open to use by the public. Determining which properties or parts of properties are within 75 feet of school grounds will likely present a challenge to applicators attempting to comply with the distance restrictions. Um, as you know, has been noted, some, some, some school properties are, are quite large or um, have uh, ball grounds, ball fields that are not contiguous with um, the primary property. I believe there are 800 schools in the state of Maine, 600 public and about 200 private. So um, that could present a significant challenge that you might just want to consider. Uh, because there is no exemption for private businesses except for commercial farms, it is our assumption that private businesses not open to use by the public <clears throat> will also be prohibited from applying synthetic herbicides within 75 feet of school grounds. Other properties that may be impacted by this bill include municipal properties and right-of-way vegetation management on <clears throat> transmission, uh, power transmission, and also um, uh, transport rights-of-way. This bill will limit tools available to effectively manage invasive plants and dermally toxic plants in the areas around schools. In certain cases, synthetic herbicides remain one of the lowest risk effective solutions for targeted management of poisonous, noxious, and invasive plants. Um, one example <clears throat> that comes to mind that's quite common is poison ivy. It's a uh, <clears throat> native plant and also somewhat common and found around parks and school grounds where children play. Human exposure to poison ivy may need to be treated with prescription medications. Physical control methods such as heavy mulching and hand removal require a significant amount of labor and or may only provide spotty or short-term suppression. And then with regard to the, the ERAC, uh, the bill pr proposes that the BPC establish an environmental risk advisory committee to assess the environmental and human health risks associated with the use of glyphosate. And this was in uh, the bills from the last session. 
Uh, and ERAC is convened uh, to provide expert advice to the board. Um, the ERAC is comprised of impartial scientists knowledgeable in the fields of biology, environmental toxicology, environmental chemistry, and ecology, who can provide expert assessments of environmental risks and provide guidance and recommendations to the board. Uh, distinct from an ERAC is the board's medical advisory committee, or MAC. Uh, the MAC is a voluntary committee comprised of experts, expert advisors knowledgeable in the field of human health research or clinical practice who add their assessments of pesticide risk to the economic and benefit recommendations provided by other entities uh, to the board uh, prior to it initiating and ruling on pesticide restrictions. Presuming the advisory committee formed in response to this bill might be tasked with answering a question relevant to the purpose of this bill, um, possibly a focus on children and their health and the risk posed by commercial application of glyphosate on school grounds in Maine, then it appears this bill ought to be asking the board to convene its MAC rather than its ERAC. Um, if the question posed by this, this bill is not, for example, what, if any, is the risk posed to the health of Maine's children by commercial application of glyphosate on school grounds, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, then it will be important to revisit the problem question and provide further clarification for board staff. Um, so I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you ha may have now or at the work session. Are there any questions for Ms. Patterson? All right, uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Director, for your um, testimony. I heard you mention um, uh, poison ivy. I just was wondering if you could talk about what substance is used for that. Yeah, so it's probably going to be glyphosate or triclopyr would be used um, primarily to control poison ivy. Those typically are the most common active ingredients also used to control most invasive plant species if you're going to, to use a chemical control method. All right, thank you. Um, and I wonder, could you comment on, do you recall both of the reports from last time around or did you go over those in preparation for today? Did I, I didn't, I just have a, a vague recollection that both both had more or less the same language relating to um, which pesticides would be prohibited and it all pertained to herbicides. But I believe it's correct that one was more inclusive and one less so. Um, and then they both had, I believe, language on ERACs. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, I guess we need some clarification as staff to know how to proceed if, depending on what the question is, because those two groups, the ERAC versus the MAC, are, are quite different, um, completely different people, completely different um, focuses. Um, so both contained that kind of language, though, so, um, instructing the board staff to form some sort of uh, study committee. All right, thank you. Yeah, I, ju I just wondered if you recalled like a position or, or any um, takes on either of those reports, but. Yeah, sorry, I, in, in terms of the BPCs, I don't think we, I don't know that we weighed in on um, either of the amendments ultimately. I think we were, those happened after we had given testimony. Sure, all right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Megan, uh, one quick question. I know certainly that when we talk about insecticide use in and around schools, um, there's a, a an exemption for insects of concern such as you know harness nest and, and the like right. could you see something similar here perhaps for poison ivy um, I don't know if it would be for plants of medical concern or, or or how that could be listed but certainly the two methods that or the two products that you use technically would be banned um, are prohibited from uh, school grounds and within 75 feet so do you have a wording that we might be able to use? Would that be plants of medical importance? I'm not sure that that's the correct way to say it. But, uh. Yeah, I think we could come back with something. I mean, I think dermally toxic plants or noxious, dermally noxious plants, noxious, dermally toxic, some combination of those words mm -hmm. would probably um, get at the essence of poison ivy. Um, yeah, if, if you could do that for the work session, I, I would appreciate that. I, I, I think that could be an exception we may be looking at. Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. Yeah, Megan, I'm also just curious, the, the definition between school grounds and school property, I guess, is what I'm, I'm wondering about. I know some schools have quite extensive campuses, and not all of the activity that, that occurs on the campus is uh, is is out on the fringes of it, if you know what I mean. 
So sometimes a 75 foot setback might in, actually be a couple hundred or more, maybe three or 400 feet. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that between the definition between the school property and the actual grounds that are utilized? Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> so we, so we define school grounds just as it's defined in this bill. Um, so I think that was taken straight from the board's rule, um, chapter <clears throat> 27. But it's land associated with a building, a school building, including playgrounds and athletic fields used by students or staff of the school. School grounds does not include land used for a school farm. Um, and that is, that is actually a bit of a departure from our, our current language. So um, it's sort of redefining what a school grounds is, we would, um, as staff and under our current school rule, include school farms and all of those other associated facilities. So I guess that's an important clarification, um, one that's made in this bill. Um, and any other outdoor area also includes um, any other outdoor area used by students or staff, including property owned by a municipality or a private entity that is regularly used for school activities by students and staff, not including land used primarily for non-school activities, such as golf courses, farms, and museums. So. Um, if there are some, like, I think maybe you're getting at if there are ball fields that are primarily used by the school that aren't necessarily contiguous with the school grounds, that, you know, as you think of the, where the building lies, then that would also be included with this. So you may have any number of fields or facilities or spaces that would be affected by this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering also, uh, Megan, uh, if, if what Representative Schofield may be getting at is I can envision, um, it, at least in my town, Old Town High School, um, has a, a, a fairly good wooded section behind the school that's part of the school grounds, which you know the students don't go on to or whatever. But I assume that would be considered school grounds, even though they don't go on there, they don't go in there. So someone on the other side of that still would be prohibited from within 75 feet is that the way you would interpret this yeah that would that would be my understanding of of this bill it would be any any of that property that would be affiliated with the school um would be included in as a part of school grounds obviously with under this bill with the exception of uh land use for a school farm okay thank you mm -hmm. Re representative hall yes thank you mr chair and thank you megan um Question just a little, thinking a little differently here. Um, say there was an outbreak of something uh, inside the school, say like, uh, you know, lice or bed bugs or something like that, which, you know, it does happen on occasion. Could you give us some thoughts on as to how this bill might affect how something like that would be taken care of? Because I know usually, you know, they spray with an insecticide or something, you know, to take care of that. Can you just maybe touch based on that? Sure. So I, I don't think this um, this bill would affect that. Um, it, in fact, it doesn't um, it doesn't address insecticides, fungicides, um, any kind of pesticide other than an herbicide. So um, just to sort of back up, herbicides are only only um, those are pesticide products that are can used to control plants. Um, so any other pesticide that might be used on school grounds, for example, for a tick and mosquito control. Um, or even in any indoor application. Um, so for controlling um, bed bugs or cockroaches or rodenticides that might be used to control, you know, it's quite common that you, you might have rodents around structures in Maine. Um, right, right. Yeah. So those are not affected by this bill or do not appear to be um, under the current language. Oh. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Senator Maxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Patterson. Um, going back to something that was in Representative Gramlich's testimony, she had mentioned that there were other school districts um, in the country that had discontinued the use of glyphosate and that Arkansas, Missouri um, have banned certain herbicides outright statewide. I'm wondering if if um, you have any knowledge of how that process has gone in other in other states, how they've navigated the 75 foot or, or you know, boundaries and barriers. And um, it seems like they're, if other states are doing it, then we can do it too with these chemicals that are quite toxic. Yeah, I don't, I guess I can't speak to what other, those other states have done at the moment, but I certainly could um, try to find out and have it ready for the work session if you like. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Director Patterson? Saying none, thank you for your testimony this morning. Thank you. 
The next three I have on my list, uh, as I have already mentioned, Andrew Hackman, Andrew King, and Don Flannery. So Andrew Hackman. Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, members of the committee. My name is Andrew Hackman, resident of Union, here on behalf of True Green Lawn Care. Uh, we did register as uh, opposed to the legislation. However, I think we've moved closer to neither for nor against, and I want to sort of explain why. One, True Green Lawn Care does not use glyphosate. Full stop, we do not use glyphosate. So uh, that's not a concern. We do apply um, herbicides on occasion in property that might be covered by the legislation. So we really are looking for clarity in some of the terminology and some of the questions that the committee has had around what was the majority report last year, where did the committee amendments go? Um, in talking to Representative Gramlich last night at 10 o'clock, uh, we are trying to, to figure out what was the final language and which was the majority report. And I appreciate Representative Gramlich's willingness to, to have that discussion and try to, to get to greater understanding. I've been able to identify that the original bill used a term called non-selective herbicide. Um, and then I looked at the committee reports and would, would really appreciate uh, a clarification from the committee analysts eventually on where the committee ended up with a majority report, but our concern is around the term of synthetic herbicide. Um, and so in the committee reports that I looked at, committee report A included just glyphosate and, and banning the active ingredient glyphosate in this, this application. Committee report B, which is what the legislation is currently modeled after, uses the term synthetic herbicide, including but not limited to glyphosate. So. Our folks have had questions, particularly in looking at the legislation this year, since it, it, it obviously uh, didn't pass last year with, with the shutdown and everybody <laughs> has a tough time remembering where we were a year ago. The question still remains for us though around this term synthetic herbicide and what that would encompass. So uh, that's the, the differences that I've been able to look at between the two committee amendments. If we can either get a clearer definition of what synthetic herbicide that, that, that are not um, glyphosate would include, or if um, it were simply limited to the active ingredient glyphosate, True Green would certainly be able to, to look at complying with the law. Um, we are not able to look at the, the label of a herbicide and necessarily have an applicator determine what is synthetic and what might be naturally derived. So um, again, that's where our question around, around actual compliance with the, with the law would be and uh, why we wanna get additional clarity uh, either through the Board of Pesticides Control and their great work or, or through uh, language that the committee might consider putting into the legislation. So again, appreciate the opportunity to testify. Uh, sorry if there's any confusion in our position with that, but um, again, we're still trying to, to answer that question around what is a synthetic herbicide and how that would apply to, to our applications in and around the school grounds. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Hackman? All right, seeing none. Thank you again. Next is Andrew King. Hi there, uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, members of the committee. My name is Andrew King, and I actually have my son Blake with me here this morning. I'm a lifelong resident of Easton and Aroostook County. I'm speaking in opposition to LD 519, an act to protect children from exposure to toxic chemicals. Taking at face value, this bill seems to be a good piece of legislation. Why in the world would anyone want to expose children to toxic chemicals? However, anytime policy is made, there's always consequences that should be weighed. I would like to relate one situation our family, school and community currently face, which should be considered by the committee. And listening to the prior testimony, I think you're leaning that way. Um, at the end of August last year, a 12 year old son, Blake, developed a nasty rash in his arms, torso, and legs. Rather than it getting better, it kept getting worse and was starting to look like severe burns. We ended up taking him to the doctor who recommended wet dressings and anti itch cream. When that did not help, he had to be put on steroid. Blake was nearly two weeks healing, missing several days of school and sports, not to mention being extremely uncomfortable. At first, we couldn't figure it out, but poison ivy seemed to be the obvious culprit. I've lived here in Easton my entire life and have not seen or heard of it in this area. It's very uncommon here. And after quizzing him, it was determined that the only place he could have been exposed was at the school. Um, 
So we contacted the school. The school did not believe us at first and assured us that it couldn't have happened there. Um, when I went to investigate the area where they were playing disc golf that day, sure enough, it was everywhere in that area and into the woods. I found the plant growing and it, area extending nearly 500 feet along the wood line there. Um, plants not only on the neighboring property, but also on the school property itself. Um, from my understanding, there's a limited number of ways to effectively control poison ivy and organic methods are largely ineffective or at least in large areas. Um, I suppose goats, boiling water, or pulling the plants could certainly be employed there. Um, the other option would be a chemical treatment with 2,4-D, triclopyr, glyphosate. Um, the chemical treatment made while the students are out for summer vacation for eight weeks seems like the obvious and most effective solution to me. Um, I have several other issues with the bill, at least specific to our school. There's a 50 acre potato field, which also abuts the school grounds here. And in my written testimony, I've attached an image of the area. Um, According to the text of the bill, the field would be exempted. There are several potentially harmful chemicals applied to this field annually, which include fertilizer, insecticides, and fungicides, along with herbicides. All chemicals, synthetic or not, have specific instructions and regulations for how they need to be applied as they are potentially harmful. This bill specifically singles out glyphosate and other synthetic herbicides. Is this implying that the other chemicals applied adjacent to the school grounds are non-toxic? These compounds, uh, are these compounds considered non-toxic when used for agricultural purposes or when applied more than 75 feet from school grounds? Uh, we rely on the EPA, Maine Board of Pesticide Control and other government agencies to develop labels, application rules and monitor use of these chemicals, both synthetic and not. Every chemical that is out there has specific use. It's labeled for along with guidelines and rules surrounding its application. And most school, schools are, or the school should be using integrated pest management on the grounds. Um, in conclusion, I asked you to consider which is worse an approved chemical applied according to the label for use on poison ivy or the risk of exposure to the poison ivy itself. The potato field next to the school is already being sprayed annually with the exact same chemicals this bill bans for non-agricultural uses, I suppose, except for the triclopyr. I doubt they use triclopyr there, but I'm sure they use 2,4-D and glyphosate depending on the crop that's in rotation. Um, but the intended use of the crop doesn't change the toxicity of the chemicals or the risk of exposure. As a main licensed forester and former dairy farmer who has held pesticide applicator licenses for both forestry and agriculture in the past, I would contend there's appropriate and safe ways to use chemicals, whether for turf and grounds maintenance or for agriculture. I believe that a chemical that is approved to be sprayed on a food crop adjacent to the school is certainly safe enough to be sprayed on the lawn or in a tree line next to it, if labeled as such. I feel these are issues that should be addressed by the Board of Pesticide Control, Maine Department of Environmental Protection, and the EPA, not the legislature. If these chemicals are unsafe to use, then they should be regulated as such by those agencies. I urge you to vote ought not to pass on LD 519. And then I would just add, it, it sounds like you are at least considering poison ivy as maybe being exempted from this bill in some in some fashion, I guess that was my primary concern with it is, you know, if you ban these sorts of chemicals, it may be the most effective way to control these plants. Um, it's going to leave the schools either applying for a variance or doing something along those lines. So I guess that was my primary concern with the bill as written. So thank you. Thank you. Rep Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator. Dan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for being here today. I'm just wondering your thoughts. You know, we're talking about a 75 foot setback from school property, uh, yeah. which then in effect uh, reduces the, uh, the, uh, the use of the private property that is adjacent to the school by 75 feet. Your thoughts about perhaps having some sort of a, uh, uh, a system where the 75 feet a 75 foot restricted area, perhaps on the school grounds itself, rather than 
rather than putting the burden on the adjacent landowner, what will your thoughts be about putting something up that the school property would be subject to a, 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 a no no enter zone, something like that? Yeah, that, that was something I, I considered. Um, actually, in the case of the Easton School, they have a disc golf course set up next to the property line there. There's also a soccer field that's fairly close in that area as well. Um, and there's basically where I found the poison ivy. And on the other corner is the potato field there. Um, so I, I just, I'm not sure, you know, kids don't only use that stuff during school hours when there's people around. Um, there's kids out there on the weekends and, you know, in the evenings after school, there's a playground there. So I'm not sure how you would ever, you know, keep kids out of that area. You know, and it, I'm not arguing that these chemicals are, are good for anybody. I mean, obviously, they've got labels that, you know, have uh, restrict how they're applied. So, you know, I, I don't I don't dispute the fact that they're not good for people and we should be considering this. I just I don't know the best way to to write the legislation, have everybody be able to live with it and still, you know, protect our kids when they're at school. Thank you. Appreciate your thoughts. Representative Osher. Can I see your hand up a minute ago? No, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Uh, Senator Maxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. King, for coming. I'm so sorry to hear about everything that, that your son has been through. That sounds really awful. Um, I was just, I was wondering, um, seems like you have a lot of, of expertise and knowledge in this area. And you were talking about how there are a limited number of ways to control poison ivy, um, and that are not organic. And the only one that you mentioned was, was glyphosate. I was wondering if there were other, other treatment options in that, you know, of for, for this problem. Um, Actually, I, I mean, there's other chemical options. They use triclopyr, and I believe 2,4-D can also be used. I think triclopyr might be the most common um, as it's a more selective herbicide. Uh, but I, from what I've read, and, it, and I, I don't want to sound like an expert here because I don't know a whole lot about poison ivy. We don't have much of it up here, but... From what I understand, I've heard people that have pastured goats and it's been quite effective in, in removing it. Um, obviously you can pull it, but I don't know how easy it would be to pull there. Um, also keeping the area mowed down, I think eventually if you keep it mowed down, can control it. The problem with that area is it's kind of outside of the ball fields. So it does get mowed, but it doesn't get mowed very often. So I think when I went up there, the lawn probably hadn't been mowed there in a week and a half or so. And uh, so I, th I think the nature of poison ivy just keeps coming back if you can't control it. And it's into the woods there as well. So I, you know, going into the woods, it looked to me like it was into the wood line there around a hundred feet. So definitely, definitely a difficult situation for the school to deal with. And, you know, I've worked with the, the uh, head jander there and we've talked about how they're going to deal with this. It was getting late in the fall last year. So, uh, I think that's on the table to try and do something with the summer form. Thank you. Can I ask one more question, Mr. Chair? Right. Um, thank you for that answer. And then I was also just wondering, as a as a parent, um, you know, acknowledging that there are other that glyphosate is being sprayed nearby, would you, would you have an inclination towards, I'm not saying that this is what I'm angling for with this bill. I'm just wondering for the conversation, if you, um, like wanted greater bans on on the ways that these chemicals are sprayed near schools or um, if you just wanted uh, more selective uses of these chemicals on school grounds. Yeah, I, I need to be careful how I answer this, but I know Don Flannery's in the audience here as well. It, you know, it, and I, I farmed growing up. I had a dairy farm. Um, I'm currently a forester. And I, you know, I think that there's ways that we can use these chemicals responsibly. And I just, I'm not sure about, you know, uh, if we should be considering agricultural land there. And I, you know, I really hate to say that because I hate to put a, you know, a farmer's livelihood is, you know, really what we're talking about here when you start talking about agriculture, rather than somebody just trying to control something. Um, 
you know, it, is it really any different for a farmer to be spraying that uh, as opposed to somebody spraying it next door? It's still the same chemical. I'm just wondering, maybe a thought would be, you know, a consideration for the farmer of when they can actually apply it. You know, do they apply it, you know, not when it's school hours or something like that um, would be the only way I could think to get around it. But, I, you know, I, it's a livelihood for a farmer. You know, I, we had cows. I grew corn. We sprayed our corn. You know, and we, we farmed every acre we could. We were paying taxes on it. So, you know, it's really tough for me to, you know, that I'm, I'm torn as I'm sure some of the committee members are as well is how do we regulate some of these chemicals and keep people as safe as we can, but still, you know, grow crops and all those kinds of things. So anyway, it might not be the best answer, but you know, it's, it's a really tough one. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative McCraig. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you, Mr. King, and have a chance to chat with you again. Uh, I, I thoroughly understand the specific issue you had, and I, God, I can't imagine being being your son going through all of that, uh, especially not knowing exactly what was causing it. But anyway, uh, apparently that specific example is the one that you're most concerned about. So my first question would be, if we could find a way to address uh, uh, school borderland poison ivy specifically for other poisonous plants, let's say. Uh, would that go quite a ways to making matters better around the Eastern school grounds? Absolutely. I, you know, and I, I think for kind of school grounds, you know, Blake plays baseball, you know, at different places, you know, in the southern part of the state where, you know, poison ivy is certainly more common. You know, I, I don't know if any of you have been to some of those sporting events, but you've got little kids running around, they're in the woods and, you know, they're around the fields. And it's a concern that I guess I never really thought much about until this happened to Blake. And, uh, you know, it, it's concerning to not have an effective way to control these. You know, when I, speaking with the head gander up here at the school, you know, they use a master applicator to do all of their pesticide application. You know, it's not like they're out there just hosing it themselves. Maybe that's not the right way to say that, but they're not applying it themselves. They're using a professional master applicator. And, they, you know, I think that there's a safe way to do it. So, yeah, I think if there was some sort of exemption in there for, you know, toxic plants, I, I think that that would address the issue as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't know why anybody else would want to necessarily spray next to a school. Um, obviously, I'm sure there's other things I'm not thinking about, but that, that would be my concern personally, for sure. Okay, I think that's, that's all I have for now. Thank you, sir. Yep. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for your testimony today and, um, and entertaining all our questions. Um, so uh, my first question that got answered was, was that um, if alternatives were available for poison ivy, would you feel like, um, like a big portion of your concerns were addressed? Um, um, something I wanted to say, I mean, I grew up in Southern Maine. I know what poison ivy looks like. I know what a thorn bush looks like. I don't walk into it. You know what I mean? Like I, we got to keep our kids safe. And and I'm sure your son was so uncomfortable. It's, it's just the worst feeling, but um, I just wanted to kind of offer some balance too, as we talk about really toxic substances. Um, and I wanted to ask you too, because something that got, um, that got raised was that we're limiting um, what a private landowner can do with, with their land just because they happen to be bordering a school. And um, you mentioned um, your background working in the woods and I wondered if you could um, talk about, with another bill we're talking about um, other limitations on, on um, applying these chemicals and one that came up was a buffer zone around water. Um, like I think it's, um, it's not so out of the ordinary to think um, to think that we want to protect 
when these things are being applied. So I'm wondering if you could just speak to that, um, that long, <laughs> long way of um, asking a question about kind of other buffers that exist for, for application and would this be so, so out of the way? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know what? I've got my own feelings on, you know, having experience in the woods, having experience farming, um, and, you know, applying some of this stuff myself. It's, uh, I think we really need to get to the point where we are employing more integrated pest management. And, you know, in my, my personal opinion, having both farmed and, and worked in the forest, the forests are really, you know, of less concern to me than, than the farms around here. Um, you know, a lot of these farms are very common for farms to be reared on the rivers. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, and this is happening worldwide, you know, concerns with chemicals. How do we get to a point where we're not relying on these chemicals quite as much? Um, you know, and I, I don't have the answer for that. Um, certainly, it's of most concern when you get near water. Um, but I, I don't have a good answer for that necessarily, other than it's something that we need to consider um, both, you know, integrated pest management wise and also conservation wise. So, you know, it, are we looking at things like, um, you know, incentivizing farmers to go to longer rotations, which they, which they have, you know, here in Aroostook County, you're seeing more four year rotations. Um, the same as in the forest, you know, we're I think forest managers are paying more attention to riparian buffers. We understand the importance of them a lot more now than we ever have. And we're still learning more about those every day. Um, you know, fish habitat, how are we impacting water quality, um, runoff sedimentation, those kinds of things. Um, so it, I don't necessarily think that banning the tools that we have today is the right answer as much as trying to work towards a better solution. You know, and these chemicals are very expensive to apply as well. So, you know, nobody wants to waste them. Nobody wants to over apply them, but they're all labeled to be used at a certain rate in order to be effective. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're putting it on aerially with a plane or a helicopter, you're ground spraying it with an air blast sprayer, you're spraying it with a, with a ground sprayer by hand. Um, that same chemicals getting, getting put applied to the crop or to the, to the soil is a pre-emergent. So, just something for maybe the committee members to think about when we're looking at these bills is, you know, we're, we're being very careful how we word them and what activities we're restricting. Um, maybe we should be considering a, a different way of, you know, do we find a better way to do this stuff um, in the form of maybe incentivizing some alternative conservation practices so we're not relying on chemicals quite so much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right, seeing none. Next is Don Flannery, followed by Julianne Smith, Patrick Valancourt, and Robert Mann. So, Mr. Flannery. You're muted, Mr. Flannery, if you're trying to speak to us. Sorry about that. I'm old and technology escapes me sometimes. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Dale, Representative O'Neill and other committee members. I'm Don Flannery, the Executive Director of the Maine Potato Board. Uh, and here to speak in opposition to LD 519. Uh, I must say that I, uh, Megan Patterson from the Board of Pesticide Control did yet a, another very good job, I think, in answering my questions before I got my turn at the mic. Uh, but our concerns were about uh, nothing to do with the setback as it relates to the uh, 75 feet around schools. It was a concern about the uh, Environmental Risk Advisory Committee uh, looking at Latin. And we were involved at this the last time around and this time. Uh, and as I read the bill, uh, I'm thinking and we're looking at this and saying, well, are we sending the Board of Pesticide Control on a, on a mission that they really don't need to be on. Uh, I think as it relates to the environmental, uh, having an envi environmental risk advisory committee, that work that they're gonna do or they would come up with has been done on both sides of this issue. And I, our suggestion before listening to Megan today 
uh, would be saying maybe the directive of the bill should be send the Board of Pesticide Control out to pull this information together and re report back to the committee uh, and do some work that way rather than put together this whole environmental risk assessment. Uh, I think Megan did an excellent job in making that, dif uh, making that distinction between the ERAC and the MAC. And uh, because of that, I, I think that's a, something that maybe, uh, maybe direct the Board of Pesticide Controls to do more so, more focused on this effort than what the ERAC would be. So I don't know if that's clear to where we are, or clear for, uh, that clear to you where we are, but our concern was on the committee, the ERAC, and going and doing the work that's been done by others. Uh, this makes more sense to do a MAC if that's what the committee chooses. So I'll gladly entertain any questions now or be available for the work session. Are there any questions for right. Representative McCray. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, here I am in Rooster County and Potato Country and Broccoli Country and all kinds of, uh, in all kinds of countries. All kinds of countries. Anyway, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, Don, Mr. Flannery, uh, I'm, I'm hearing from you today that your main concern isn't so much with what we might come up with with, with reasonable setbacks, but those, the uh, risk committee, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, exactly. I, I would, our concern wasn't at all on the setbacks or any of that. It just seemed to us that if, uh, well, like I said, the, the environmental work on uh, glyphosate and synthetic herbicides has been done by so many people for so long on both sides of the issue, whether you're supported or you're opposed to it. It just didn't make sense to us to have the Board of Pesticide Control and spend that amount of time and there will be a physical note to it and resources. When the work's been done, it might make more sense just to have them compile all that and bring it back to the committee. But now that Megan explained uh, the, the MAC versus the ERAC, I think that probably makes sense. Okay, I think we're in pretty good shape. Thank you, sir. Yep. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Mr. Flannery, for your testimony. Something that came up um, with the last um, gentleman who spoke was, um, was kind of a frustration with um, with regs getting proposed or, you know, different restrictions. And, um, and I wonder if you could speak to this because something that he brought up was um, incentivizing the good things that we want to see happen. Um, mm -hmm. And you cited a couple um, examples in, in your industry. Um, but something I wanted to bring up is that um, I saw your organization come and oppose a bill that that would have brought, you know, created a voluntary program, didn't even put money in it, just made a bucket of money to accept federal funds. Um, so I want to hear from you whether you would be opposed to kind of anything across the board, um, or is it, um, is there like tr truly an, an openness to um, kind of shifting things in the right direction? with incentives, with, with options to help people get to those better places? Oh, to say there isn't opportunities and we're not we're opposed to anything across the board, no, of course not. Uh, our opposition, uh, I can't remember the LD number, but soil health bill was that we felt that that did not need to, for the department to put a plan together and to receive funds it did not have to be put in legislation. And by putting it in legislation would create a matrix in which directs the department or puts one industry or I'm sorry I'm sorry to interrupt I just think I I would like you to speak to the fact just that you came opposing this kind of voluntary thing that was I, I'm just explaining I'm representative I'm explaining why we opposed it that's what I was answering your question thank you are there other questions Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next is Julianne Smith, followed by Patrick Valancourt, and then Robert Mann. Julianne, we can't hear you for some reason, even though it doesn't say you're muted. Nope, 
Still can't hear you. Maybe if you log out and log back in and I'll go on to the next person and see if that works for you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go on to Patrick Valencourt. Good, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, so I'm Patrick Valencourt and uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, members of the committee, the ACF committee. Uh, I'm the owner operator of Northern Turf Management, specialty plant uh, and turf healthcare company in Sear Plantation, so up in the county. And I'm here today opposed to LD519. Um, I've been in this industry, the turf and ornamental healthcare industry since 2012, a BS degree in horticulture from UMaine, and an AS degree in turf management from UMass Amherst Stockbridge School. I got into this industry because I love the outdoors and working to create outdoor spaces that are functional, appealing, and beneficial to everyone process of doing my job, I strive to protect the environment by using the best practices and science available to accomplish that. I've been a licensed Maine commercial master applicator since 2012, one of the youngest to become licensed at the time. It's been important to me since the beginning of my career to be well-schooled in the proper methods and techniques safely apply pesticides, if they are necessary. During the course of my work, there are times that pesticides must be used to prevent or cure damaging pest issues. Despite following university BMPs to grow healthy turf and ornamentals and using cultural practices to prevent pest issues in the first place, chemical control is sometimes the best option when all factors are considered. When it comes to schools in particular, I work with several of them in Aroostook County. Each school has an IPM coordinator who most of the time, alongside school admin staff and I, coordinate all pest management decisions. There is not a spray and pray mindset when it comes to managing pests, weeds, insects, diseases, especially on school grounds. Based on the particular school's budget, expectations, and any previous pest history a plan is developed, both in the interest of cost and reducing pesticide use, targeted spot treatments are the preferred method. Now, for example, an athletic field or other high traffic turf area has never seen any maintenance besides a lawnmower, may require a blanket application of herbicide, to control broadly in grassy weeds, insecticide to take care of an active grub infestation, etc. These wide area applications are more the exception than the rule and are not purely cosmetic. A stand purely of dandelions, thistles, and crabgrass rather than turf grass provides terrible uniformity and footing for athletes. If grubs or other insects devour the majority of a turf area, you have bare soil. A particular point I'm trying to make with these statements is that pesticides are just a tool in the toolbox, but sometimes the best and only tool. Speaking specifically about herbicides, there are several uses beyond what I've previously mentioned regarding turf grass. Many schools have small propane tank farms in and around where there is a zero tolerance for any vegetation due to fire hazards. Rather than having a potentially untrained person with a power tool around gas lines knocking down grass and weeds every week, a single targeted pre and post emergent herbicide application could control that vegetation for the entire season, one application. Similar applications in other areas around school buildings, sidewalk curbing, drainage ditches and the like, not only keep things neat and clean at a much lower cost than mechanical methods, it also eliminates potential rodent and insect arborages, which also carry diseases and, and such. In terms of further regulation and environmental risk assessment, I feel that trying to reinvent the wheel isn't necessary. There's already a strong system in place, starting with the US EPA into individual states, such as our main border pesticide control, whose sole purpose is to evaluate pesticides and their effects based on sound science. Now I'll leave you with a statement directly from US EPA released last year regarding glyphosate in particular. EPA has concluded its regulatory review of glyphosate, the most widely used herbicide in the United States, after a thorough review of the best available science as required under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, EPA has concluded that there are no risk of concern to human health when glyphosate is used according to the label and that it is not a carcinogen. These findings on human health risk are consistent with the conclusions of science reviews by many other countries and other federal agencies, including USDA, Canadian Pest Management Regulatory Agency, Australian Pesticide and Veterinary Medicines Authority, European Food Safety Authority, and German Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, 
And I just ask that, you know, as part of all this, pesticides are a tool in the toolbox. They're not the be all and end all. You know, I think it's good to have all the tools available to us, not necessarily be using them all the time. You just have them available. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Valancourt? Representative Osher. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and uh, Chair Dill, and thank you, Mr. Valancourt, for coming to our committee. Uh, I understand how important it is to have tools to do the work that you do, uh, but it, my understanding is also that the, some of the tools that you're using, there's evidence that they are toxic and that they're a problem. And isn't it our job as legislators to try to, to collect that information and figure out where we need to set limits? So with your testimony, you are, that could be a blanket testimony for any pesticide that you use, that you wanna have that tool available. So can you speak specifically to the pesticides that are being addressed in this bill? Well, it seems that, you know, it's kind of a blanket thing. It talks about synthetic herbicides, you know, including but not limited to glyphosate. So, you know, maybe some clarification there. But again, you know, this is why we have the US EPA. It's why we have the more main board of pesticides control. You know, I, I think this is primarily their job and they have the science, the expertise, you know, to do that work. And I really don't think it's the place of the legislature uh, to, to rule on, you know, specific chemicals. Uh, I really think that that's why we have these agencies in place because this is what they do. They are the gold standard in terms of, you know, pesticides, their risks, what they should and shouldn't be used for, labels, you know, the like. Um, so, you know, I think the system that's in place is a great one. Uh, so I, I guess I don't see the need to really change that. So, so you, you're saying that you don't see the need for this committee to re evaluate tools that are used in the state of Maine? I guess not to the extent that it, it seems that it's going that towards your, that limits your you. As long as you're not limited, we can do our job. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you know I, I think some of this legislation can have broad ranging effects. That you know, a lot of things that the Board of Pesticides Control does and regulates already addresses this. I, I really don't feel that there's any further need uh, to, to jump into this. You know, that that's their job and they do a great job at it. Are there other questions? Seeing none. Oops, hold it, Representative McCray. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I know sometimes I wait right till the last second, waiting to see if somebody else can ask the same question. Uh, uh, good morning, Mr. Viancourt. Uh, I know that you're very well trained in pesticide usage uh, for the management of, of problems around schools and, other, and elsewhere. Uh, I'm sure that we can all agree that sometimes industry has an undue influence on policy and policy board makers, et cetera, and policy boards, et cetera, like that. Uh, just the sheer lobbyist efforts, we've seen it right here on this committee. Uh, you mentioned that the pesticides were a tool in your toolbox. Okay, so what one of the tools in your toolbox. So in your business or your part of the industry, what are the other tools that you would employ? So uh, I guess, let me give you an example. Uh, let's say we're talking about a sports field and you know, coming up to a sports field that hasn't been maintained in years, you know, just they mow it, that's it. In the beginning, yeah, you know, if you wanna, promote uniformity, you know, get rid of weeds that kids can trip on because all bumpy and, and whatnot. Uh, yeah, you have to make it a blanket application of herbicide, clean that up. But then after that, you know, you follow standard turf cultural practices, proper mowing, you know, cultivation, aeration, seeding, um, you know, all of those things that promote healthy turf. Well, once you make that initial blanket application using a tool in your toolbox, once you've done that once, then you don't have to go back as long as you follow these cultural practices. You don't have to go back every year and make blanket applications. You can simply spot treat. You know, sometimes that'll work with insects as well. You know, we're not talking about insecticides here, but you know, okay, you, you clean up an, an insect infestation. Then after that, you can spot treat. 
again, because you have those tools. Um, that's kind of, a, I guess, a good example. Uh, you know, the same thing regarding, you know, excessive vegetation around, you know, propane tanks or right around the school building, whatever. If you've had a rodent issue in the past, you know, maybe first you, you knock everything down with a, you know, a trimmer, you know, cut it, whatever. Uh, make one application of herbicide so that you knock it out, prevent growth for a while. And, and then again, spot treatments, you know, tool in the toolbox, you know, use proper IPM, use proper cultural practices. And I guess those are two pretty good examples that I could think of right off. Follow up, please, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so Mr. Vancor, I, I, I do appreciate everything you're saying. Uh, in my mind, and I probably all of us, there is a difference between spraying, let's say a potato field, uh, a forest, uh, maybe even somebody's lawn. There's a difference between those applications and a place where that is meant for kids to play on. Uh, so could you address how you feel about the differences in those kinds of applications? I guess to that, to that end, you know, besides the fact that there are specific, you know, restrictions, notification requirements in this and the like in Maine regarding school grounds, you know, besides that, again, I'll, I'll fall back on, you know, the US EPA that labels these products, you know, if, if they don't feel that there needs to be a specific restriction for, you know, this product on this ground, you know, whether I'm applying all of life, say whatever, to someone's residential yard versus, you know, around school grounds. It's not just because that it's on a school ground that, you know, the label magically say, oh, well, this is more toxic over here. Um, you know, I would argue that, yeah, there's kids on school grounds more than other areas say, but those same kids, they may go home that same day and have had the same pesticide applied according to the same label, you know, at their home. So I guess I, I'm, I'm kind of wrestling with how is one spot more toxic than the other if it's applied the right way. You know what I'm getting at? Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Mr. Valancourt, for your testimony. Um, good to have you back and appreciate your participation in the process. Um, it's good to have folks that do this work here. Um, Part of what my question is for you is you were talking about um, the EPA's approach as the gold standard um, and the way, oh, my battery's gonna die soon. But um, so if I go away, that's why. But um, our approach is, um, is not one that prioritizes human health. As you know, um, the American approach is to do kind of like a cost benefit analysis. Um, and it's, you know, it's more like, is there an unreasonable risk because we're doing a cost benefit analysis rather than prioritizing human health. So when I hear you say that um, EPA is taking care of it, you know, we've already looked at these substances um, and knowing that in the US, you know, folks are able to, to throw things out on the market even before um, we have a ton of data about safety. Um, my question for you is, do you see a value in looking at um, certain spaces, as Representative McCray was talking about, that we know kids are playing on um, when it's the state's role to, you know, to protect health, safety, welfare? Um, why would it be inappropriate to make limits on, you know, certain small carve outs of spaces like school grounds where we know kids are playing if we know that we have um, other ways to to do things like manage poison ivy when we're talking about toxic chemicals. So, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely can see, you know, where you're coming from, you know, with school grounds, more kids are around, you know, I definitely get that. And I would say that, you know, restrictions or maybe a little bit of limitation on, you know, what can be applied timing, um, you know, things of that nature, you know, yeah, that's not a, a huge deal. I think an outright, ban i don't think that's i don't think that really is reasonable or is practical just for some of the reasons that have been brought up today uh you know again 
cleanup of, of certain things, you know, poison ivy, uh, other weeds, uh, things that are fire hazards, you know, as far as weeds, you know, cause I, I've seen a lot of that. Um, so, you know, do I think that there's certain things that we could come to a compromise on in regard to that? Sure. But again, just an outright ban, say, you know, no synthetic herbicides or, you know, whatever the case may be as we go through this whole process, you know, I don't, I think they're somewhere in the middle. I really do. So that's, I guess, the best answer for that for me. Thank you. Oh, can I ask a follow-up, please, Mr. Chair? Yes. Thank you. Um, so do you see a distinction between um, the kind of grub treatment that you were talking about and, and chemicals that might be used for that and, um, and you know, poison ivy or something like that? Yeah. So, you know, like I mentioned, I, I think in terms of, you know, okay, th there's an issue, things that haven't been addressed for many years and now it's either we can address it kind of selectively, like I mentioned, you know, one-time deal, clean up what we have to clean up and then proper cultural practices, manage spot treatments or, you know, the other side is of it, if, okay, well, we can't do that. Well, now we got to start over and replant the whole field or, you know, come in with an excavator and, and rip out poison ivy or, you know, something like that. Again, I think there's a, a middle ground, um, an outright ban I don't, I don't think is, is there. Um, you know, all the way, the other way, maybe not great either. But like I said, you know, maybe a case by case basis say, Hey, you know, we need to maintain this field and either we can do it, you know, two treatments here and there, and then spot treatments after that, or, Hey, we've got to rip out this whole field and replant it. You know, a lot of schools can't afford that period. You know? So I, I do think there's a middle ground in regards to that. Thanks for your testimony. Appreciate it. Are there any other questions for Mr. Valancourt? Seeing none, before we continue, I would like to remind the committee that uh, these are often emotional issues that we discuss on this committee, and there are differing opinions. But the folks here that are testifying in front of us are volunteers, and they need to be treated with respect, even though it may be an opinion that's different from yours. Now, I've been a little lenient, maybe too much lenient, but I will shut committee members off if, you know, it gets out of hand in my opinion and that's it. So I'm just telling the committee that. Thank you. Next up is Julianne Smith. Can't hear you. Can't hear Julianne. Sorry, I don't know what the problem was. All right, so next is, let me see, Robert Mann, followed by Victoria Wallach and Heather Spaulding. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Senator Dill. Um, my name is Robert Mann. I'm with the National Association of Landscape Professionals, and I'm here today in opposition to LD 519. I would refer to the committee to my written remarks that I submitted last night. Opposition is actually in support of the legislative and regulatory status quo. And in testimony today, you've heard from a number of different uh, uh, that, that allude to the interaction professional applicators and school districts in, in formulating IPM programs that match the individual uh, the individual needs of the school, whether it happens to be a, a ball field that's close by or a ball field that's further away, um, you know, poison ivy on the site, poison ivy not on the site. And this is how the regulatory space actually accommodates individual local action to give you as committee and you as a legislature offer up a framework for the evaluation of pesticide products and then you allow uh, actual experts that you hire in the in the in the form of you know Megan Patterson and 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 Pam Byer and all the others that the Board of Pesticide Control that are that are that are very deeply schooled in this uh, in this topic and as Senator Dill mentioned, approach this topic in a completely unemotional way. Um, we ask that you simply follow the science. And the science that we wish for you to follow is that which that emulates from the EPA. And as Mr. Valancourt eloquently stated, I, you know, I, I appreciated his testimony this morning. The EPA is the gold standard uh, when it comes to the evaluation of pesticides worldwide. And you know, only 
you get to see that in the context of how other other nations approach the it this is a very unapproachable subject you need to spend a enormous time reading an enormous amount of documentation that comes from EPA to get a sense of how elaborate this process is. And that's certainly the case when it comes to glyphosate. And in my written testimony, I, I called a couple of uh, a couple of bullet points from EPA that, you know, and I'm not just saying these things because I want to hear myself say them. If I tell you something, uh, if I make an assertion, I will give you the reference to where I find these, uh, where I find these points so that you can see them for yourself. Now, now, as it relates to glyphosate, um, it, the EPA has it, it has been in the process of going through a re-registration process um, with this and in all in all pesticides for that matter that has to conclude in another 18 months. But in their in their evaluation, they found no risk of human concern from current uses of glyphosate. And there is no indication that children are more sensitive to glyphosate. In fact, EPA found no risk of concerns for children entering or playing on residential areas treated with glyphosate. And then we come to the, uh, the, the question as to whether or not these products are, are going to be, you know, I'm, I'm speaking glyphosate specifically, but pesticides in general, you know, where are we going to look for research that, that evaluates whether these products are going to be dangerous to ourselves? to farmers, dangerous to the public. And we can look to a, a, a group, a study called the Agricultural Health Study. And this is a group of roughly 60,000 pesticide applicators in the state of North Carolina and Iowa farmers that have been followed by uh, a collaboration of the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, Environmental Protection Agency, OSHA, um, looking at their, that their pesticide use uh, you know, over the long now, it, having such a large set of data, they went back and looked at whether or not there was an association between glyphosate, specifically, and which is something that's uh, pre prevalent in the in, in the mainstream media as, as uh, glyphosate causing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And their conclusion was, in this large perspective association, was apparent between glyphosate and any solid tumors. Life, um, lymphoid malignancies overall, including non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and its subtypes. So, you know, that's something you can go back and read and, and review on your own. Um, Your I, three I minutes are up. Can you take a couple okay. sentences to finish up, please? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, I could go on for an hour. So why don't I stop there? <laughs> and if you have, I'm sure you could. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Mann? Representative Kluker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Mann, could you just let us know uh, who, you said the national, who, who's funding you to come here today? I, I represent the National Association of Landscape Professionals and my, and my members in Maine, Mr. Valencourt being one of them. It, where does that funding come from? Uh, funding is from our membership. Uh, you know, we're, we're an association of landscape contractors. Oh, great. So no, no funding from national sources, just local no, main. No, 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 no. It's okay. an association of, of landscape contracting companies. So, but you mentioned it was a national association, but it's a, but it's That's a local correct. organization. Okay. Well, we have, we, you know, we have, we have local members in Maine and you know, that Mr. Mr. Valancourt would be a perfect example of that. Great. And you mentioned choosing the science and you mentioned that you choose the science from the EPA. Could you say why you choose that science as opposed to choosing other science? We want to find, we want to find a, a, a source that's objective and science-based. In other words, we want to find the science. We want to find the science with someone that doesn't have an, an agenda that goes along with, you know, with the science. And it's very difficult to, you know, to parse all these things out. And we have to find someone that we that we that we can't, that we we trust in common. And I, I have the privilege of being able to interact with. And, and to tell them about how these products are used by lawn and landscape contractors. And, you know, you know on a professional staff, they're not political at all. They're, they've been there forever. Um, you know, they're scientists in their own right. They're credentialed in their own right. And, you know, the, and they, you, know, you can see by reading their, their decisions that, you know, they're following sciences and the science and not, uh, you know, partisan or, or uh, industry edicts. Uh, and, you know, that's very easy to re reduce this to sound bites, but it's only through reading that you can really begin to understand this. 
yeah and it, it sounds like it's it i my every time i go to choose science every time i go to choose which science i'm choosing and which science i'm not choosing I have a reason I choose the science that I choose and I have a reason I choose the science that I don't choose. I actually went and, and looked up that, uh, the ag health study you were, or I, I was looking, I looked at one of them, obviously they do a lot of work from NIH, which is great. And if you looked at some of the work that they've done around, I mean, this isn't exactly what we're talking about today, but organochlorine insecticides and, and the rates of, uh, of, I'm sorry, the rates of autoimmune and autoimmune diseases for health workers, and is that kind of is that the kind of science you look at on a regular basis? Yeah, and that's the whole point behind the re-registration process that EPA is it, that it goes you know goes through. And that re-registration process is part of the Food Quality Protection Act. And you know it's a 15-year cycle that was started um, with the passage of that bill. So every pesticide in, individual pesticide active ingredient must go through that process of reevaluation over and again, such that when you know a group like uh, a study like Agricultural Health Study bring something back that's adverse that was not known previously, they can incorporate that new science into the new decision making. And that's science that you would advocate for when coming to our committee. That's exactly right. Great. And when we're talking about children, I was wondering the length of the studies that we are looking at for organophosphates uh, in, in exposure to children. Well, the EPA is probably, this is part of the FQ, FQPA, uh, it, it looks at how human beings, you know, and children specifically are exposed to individual pesticides in the environment as a whole. In other words, you know, if we're looking at glyphosate, it's just, just as an example, how much glyphosate is a child being exposed to in the food that they eat, in going to school, in around the home, any, any one of a number of different uh, ways that they're exposed. And then all of those exposures are put into what's known as the risk cup. In other words, it's additive, you know, your exposures are added together. And then when, you know, the EPA comes up with, uh, you know, levels of concern that they, they, they draw up. And then if you happen to be, uh, if there happen to be levels of concern that are, that are above that, in other words, if the risk cup is overflowing, then the EPA goes and looks for ways to reduce the amount of, uh, of these products that are in the environment and doing that through either telling a farmer that, you know, that they can't use as much of this particular product or telling a lawn and landscape contractor that they can, they can no longer use this particular product on a lawn or a garden, that type of thing. So these are, uh, these are these are you know conversations that EPA has that you know take years in order to figure out. But then when you come up the other end, you know the, all of these things are being considered in the aggregate. So you don't have a clear idea about the length of time the study of glyphosate in children took place. You don't know the length of time that that they studied that, like uh, the, the number of years of exposure to the children. Well, the, all I can do is, is point back to what EPA says, and that my my quotations that I um, that I that I use are just just a you know, tip of the iceberg. We can you know we can you know have an, a day long conversation about you know what they uh, you know what the EPA found. It's all discoverable, and you know we can we can go in and, and read all of the reports and 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 pluck out what you know what the answers to our questions are. Yeah, choosing our science again. Yeah, and and so I'm Representative Polker, oh, we do defer. We got some more questions. I'll come back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. Uh, thank you, sir, for being here today. I'm just wondering. You 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 mentioned a little bit about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and I I know that that's been an issue over the last couple of decades regarding a lot of these products. Could you expand a little bit on that and just and tell us what the uh, what the latest uh, findings are from and, and what you think about it from your organization standpoint? Appreciate it. Well, yeah, that's a that's a dangerous question because I'm I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist. I, I simply uh, look out into the into the wide world as as we all do and take in information and try to make sense out of it. I can provide the committee with our uh, how our association feels on the uh, on the uh, on the topic with a white paper. I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, but I will tell you that you know the EPA in in concert with Health Canada uh, and and every other uh, pesticide regulatory agency in the world has come to a very similar conclusion 
that you know the glyphosate is is not a carcin you know, not a carcinogen, and that uh, you know that they strongly push back EPA especially strongly pushes back on that uh, that contention. Um, you'll see that there's quite a bit of activity between the EPA and the state of California. Um, you know, California saw fit to run with the uh, the uh, uh, IARC determination that uh, glyphosate was carcinogenic and listed on their Proposition 65 list. EPA pushed back against that, saying that you know the uh, that you know they, they disagreed strongly with it, and you know that that's still playing out in the courts. But you know it's uh, and it's so unfortunate that this is. Uh, that this whole issue is so so deeply um, politic politicized, um, you know. If I could just jump, you know, there was uh, Andrew King made a mention that you know how do we look at this in a larger context of being able to feed ourselves in the long run and be less uh, reliant upon pesticides. And um, I recently read a, a book called Five uh, Food 5.0, written written by a gentleman by the name of Robert Sake, who's an agronomist from Canada, who who takes us through this entire uh, this entire scenario and. Uh, is is eye opening and is an excellent book. I would highly recommend it. Um, you know, not only for the this discrete issue that we're talking about today, but for food policy in general. And certainly, you know, Maine has a very uh, very prominent role in the agriculture community. You know, the, the food that comes from Maine is not only wonderful, but you know, is is essential for you know national food supply. That, that white paper you mentioned, that might be something that I think we might be interested in reviewing. So that would be appreciated. Thank you very much. Happy to. Senator Maxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Mann. I just have a few questions. Sure. Um, Mr. Mann, you were just talking, um, you alluded to the, to the ongoing litigation around the use of glyphosate. Um, the almost $10 billion that has already been handed out and Bayer, which um, is the company that owns Roundup, which is the, the um, primary ingredient is glyphosate. That's the target of these lawsuits. They've just set aside another $2 billion um, for future legal claims. I'm wondering why, why you think they are, are doling out billions of dollars um, if this is a safe product. Um, I think that their statement, uh, you know, surrounding this is pretty much right on point is that you know, there's the uh, toxicological and medical, uh, you know, considerations, but they also have uh, legal considerations and that, you know, they have uh, a business to run and, you know, they have to decide whether or not they wish to continue to litigate and uh, or to try to settle and make the problem go away. Um, that's, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so I, I really, I, I can't speak for them, but I think that you can also discover in, uh, in, in press releases and press stories uh, that surround this issue, you know, uh, far more um, insightful answers than I'll be able to provide you, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and then another question, Mr. Chair, sure. following up on something that Representative Fluker <laughs> asked you, um, you, does your organization have any connection with Bayer or those who own or produce glyphosate products? No, no financial considerations. Obviously, they're you know they're a um, uh, an organization that we we know many people that work there. You know we um, you know, that that it, but that's just a normal uh, you know normal interaction between groups. Okay, and then my final question is, if that's true, can you tell me why Bayer sponsored a conference for your organization last year? We have many, many sponsors for conferences that um, you know, very generously sponsor their uh, you know, training sessions that we, that we have. You know, these training sessions uh, teach our, our, our members how to use pesticides uh, correctly, and you know, they um, rely upon uh, you know, groups like you know, cooperative Ascension to come and speak to us, uh, experts on um, you know, individual pests and you know, entomologists and uh, weed scientists and so forth. Um, that's that's not any that's not unusual at all for an, an organization to have sponsorships like that. I understand that, but wouldn't you say that a massive corporation uh, sponsoring conferences for your association is in fact a financial connection to some of the arguments that you are making today? Well, I, I think it's not. We're not. We're not. It, they're not influencing what we say. And you know that you know, we we can come out and say you know glyphosate this, glyphosate that. Um, but you know we we that's why I said that you know you have to rely upon the science. If I tell you something, 
I'm going to be able to draw back to a source and that source is going to either validate or invalidate what I have to say. And um, you know, I don't think that's unusual or, or inappropriate. Well, it seems inappropriate to me. Thank you so much, sir. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Mann, thanks for your testimony. I had a follow up on um, j just to understand. So you're a um, you're the nationwide kind of um, umbrella over all of your member organizations that are local. That must be mm -hmm. kind of like the state chamber over local chambers of commerce. Like, are, are is it all funded by um, local dues, or are there other sources of funding for you? Yeah. We have alliances with state organizations. We, um, you know, there there isn't a state organization per se in Maine that we're that we're allied with, unfortunately. Uh, although, you know, there are ad hoc groups that we, you know, we, we get together with. And um, but, you know, this is not a a, a um, an organization that has uh, like franchises, for instance. Um, you know, the I I, I has, uh, point out that, you know, it wasn't until, you know, a couple of years ago that I myself was, you know, licensed in Maine. I was, uh, you know, a practitioner before I came to work uh, for NALP. And I was, uh, you know, I was licensed and, and, and you know, uh, you know, had a had business relationships in Maine uh, that, uh, you know, were sold and bought and sold. And so I went on to, you know, this position here. So, you know, I, I do have a connection, you know, a local connection. Um, so is it only funded by, is it only funded by no. dues? Dues, yeah. And only funded by dues? Just, well, no, we have, you know, we have conferences, you know, we have events and conferences um, that we, that we, uh, you know, charge admission for, but, you know, that uh, nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary or anything different than any other association and any, any industry is going to do. Okay. Um, I'm not hearing a clear answer. So just for the um, work session, would you be able to um, just talk about what your sources are? And just like the structure? Mm -hmm. That would be really nice. Representative Hall. Yes, Mr. Chair, a uh, question to you. Are we maybe getting off subject just a little bit here? Thank you for bringing that up, uh, we, we may be, and uh, I think that's why I was asked for work sessions. So we'll move on from that line of questioning where folks get their funding from. It's been asked of some other ones I know as we went along. Um, and I thought it was answered that it's from dues and that type of thing, but uh, it was asked if there's any other sources of funding and I'm sure if there are, um, they'll bring that forward. But I thank you, Representative Paul, for your question. And, uh, and I hear what you're saying. Moving on to Representative Pluka, did you have more questions? No. Oh, thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I think um, this is, you know, somebody else had a question about um, me asking a similar kind of question at a previous public hearing. And I just wanted to say, we have a whole, you know, system of, lobbyist registering and, and monitoring how campaign money gets spent. And the reason we do that is um, just so that the public can know, you know, who's weighing in on different issues and, and just people to evaluate the information that we're getting. So, um, so that's how I see that as important. Do um, you have another question? I did have a question. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think Um, what I'm hearing um, when we're talking about making these, you know, small, small restrictions on um, on school grounds, um, what I'm hearing you um, backing up the use of um, of chemicals with as a justification is that um, whatever EPA puts out is the gold standard, um, and um, we're not talking about FIFRA in, in particular, which, you know, when you look at different environmental statutes, um, most employ risk-based standards, um, and they're softened only by the availability of, um, control technologies. Um, what I would like to hear from you on is, um, just just in the context of what my colleagues have brought up about 
existing settlements, billions of dollars about, about health, um, human health. Why not um, take more of a precautionary approach when we know that our approach under FIFRA is more of a cost benefit one? Um, can we call it the gold standard um, when, when we're not prioritizing human health, when, the, when what we're really doing is engaging in a balancing analysis? And, um, and if we're not taking more of a precaution or sorry, a precautionary approach to managing risk in this way, what's the justification? Like what kind of products are we talking about using? Is it about grubs? You know, I just, I wanna get, um, open that question up a little bit more of what are we, what are we really protecting here when we wanna be able to kill grubs? Well, with like all due respect, you know, you, it's from getting poison ivy or things like that. Well, with all due respect, you know, you've made the assertion that EPA is not prioritizing human health risk assessment, and I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, and you know that, that, you know, and only, only in diving into their written documentation can you can you discover that, and that that that's true for any one of the pesticides that's been registered, and and then you bring it down to the. At times of the local level, you know, we're trying to make decisions about whether or not this should be treated or that should be treated. You know, your 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 framework already allows for that. That's what the IPM um, requirements in, in regulation are. In other words, if you were to look at, um, you know, Mr. Valencourt's, you know, um, you know, uh, um, example where you know you have poison ivy, you know, in a in a school, you know, well. Shouldn't that be, you know, the school recognizing that, you know, the poison ivy presents a hazard to the children? That's something that, you know, either they, you know, that they go through a process of IPM, which is discovering whether or not this is something needs to be treated or not, whether, you know, goats will do the trick or not do the trick. And then if they do wind up in a situation where, um, you know, the school and the pesticide applicators say, yeah, the, you know, glyphosate is the correct answer in this particular case. Um, after having looked at all the, you know, all of the situation that they can't go ahead and do, you know, what they need to do. I mean, it was, you know, I, I can recall, you know, a, a number of winters ago, I was installing an irrigation system on a golf course and I was digging in, in, in the ground in the middle of the winter and they got a nasty case of poison ivy owing to the fact that, you know, poison ivy is, is, always, is always toxic, is toxic in all of its parts and it, whether living or dead. So, if you were to send the goats in to you know, clean out an area of poison ivy, they aren't going to eat the roots. They are, they're, they're, the roots are going to just regenerate and give and, and give you uh, you know more poison ivy plants. And then if you were to use the glyphosate, glyphosate is a systemic herbicide. In other words, it's taken into the plant and translocated through the, the vascular system and will kill all portions of the plant. So you know it's and then to, I would rather a scenario where that that type of discussion is between the school, which obviously is going to care about the children, and the applicator, which is going to it, it brings the expertise to the table. So, you know, that's that's what I'm pointing at, is that the, the existing uh, framework that you said that is in law, that is in regulation, that is administered by, you know, by Megan Patterson and all the people that work for her actually does work and actually does address the concerns that you're, that you're presenting. Representative McCray. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've been vacillating as to whether raise my hand or not, raise my hand or not. And I finally obviously went with raise my hand. Uh, uh, Mr. Mann, thank you very much for being here. I know you've been a bit on the hot seat and, and I may not make it any easier, but so I sympathize. Anyway, uh, I, I, I come to this committee ha after having been a 48 year science teacher, life science teacher. And I'm not the only person that has a, has a pretty strong science background on this committee. And one of the things that I taught uh, was that all investigation in science should be unbiased. If you introduce bias, you're, you're putting in bad influence and you have, you almost out of necessity come up with bad results or unreliable results. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at it that way. Last year uh, on another bill, not this particular bill, uh, we had scientists come in and I gotta tell you, I was blown away by their expertise. One said that glyphosate was, <laughs> you could almost drink it. And the other one, 
quite the opposite, 180 degrees. And both were very well educated scientists. So I think both were brought in from a point of bias. There's not any question. And I think they probably were great scientists, but that was their job. So I guess my question of you is, if this bill went forward, I mean, we are the policymakers. We, that's what a, a political body does. They look at the welfare, et cetera, of, of all and the economy of all, and we come up with policy. So let's suppose this bill passes. How would that affect people in your membership? Well, first, you know, I, I thank you for the question. Um, and I don't mind being the skunk at the garden party. I, you get used to it in my position. And actually, it's quite enjoyable because, you know, if I can't articulate something, then, you know, I need to go back and, and reevaluate what it is that I'm thinking such that I can, you know, answer your question. I actually agree with what you said, and, you know, with, with the possible exception of ascribing bias to the different, um, you know, the different parties that you were speaking to. It's not necessarily that they're bias. They, they, they come, to, to come to the table with two different hypotheses. And you keep testing those hypotheses and, and, and come up with one that's, that, you know, that, that you know to be you know, more right than the other. And that's, that's part of the process. I mean, that's, that's something that we should welcome. Um, you know, if you put two things together, which one comes out on top and which one, which, which one gets discarded. Um, and then, you know, then I had the, I had the great uh, pleasure to uh, watch a, uh, a webinar by uh, Dr. Pam Beyer, who's your toxicologist for the Board of Pesticide Control. And she spoke to this, to this topic. And, you know, I've heard this topic mentioned, you know, uh, presented by many, many different people over the years. And she was, it, she was just incredibly good at getting across important, uh, you know, important, uh, you know, points that need to be considered here. And, you know, it's a shame that she's not here to speak to you today. And, you know, that that's exactly the type of expertise that I wish that you would rely upon. You know, that, you know, the proper, and my personal opinion is the proper role for the, for the is to set up the framework and not, not to make the decisions. In other words, you set up the framework and then tell Megan Patterson, go out and make the decisions. And that, you know, that's the proper way to do it. So, and that's where the, that's where my opposition to this bill is, is that you call out, you know, a, a specific active ingredient or a specific group of ingredients. And say that you know this for you know you, you make the determination that these aren't uh, you know these aren't uh, acceptable, and then put that into law. Where does this from there? I mean, you know, where the, the entire you know the entire you know framework that you've already set up in law and regulation actually works quite well. Quick, quick follow up, follow up, Representative McCray. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, I, I think you addressed my, my, my precursor extremely well. Okay, but my question was, if this were to pass, how would it affect uh, the applicators and the professionals that you represent? My apologies for not answering that. You know, my brain it's okay. Sometimes. It's okay. Um, well, it, it, I wouldn't be as effective. You know, in a position where the best choice uh, for problem you know, after you go through all the best management practice protocols, after all of the integrated pest management protocols and done everything else that you, you could do to solve the problem without a use of a pesticide. And you come to the point where you say, well, geez whiz, I think the glyphosate is probably the best choice here. You my, my the end result won't be effective or as effective. And in fact, you know, there, 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 you know, I was, I'll mention, I mentioned this in my, in my testimony, the written testimony that you could actually go out and find uh, organic herbicides to, you know, to apply that are actually more toxic than glyphosate. So, you know, there's that whole, um, you know, fallacy about, you know, the, the organic versus, uh, you know, organic versus synthetic that needs to be addressed. And, you know, that's why, you know, when we look at these products, we look at them individually without regard to whether or not they're organic or synthetic or, or whatever it happens to be. And we just, we look at them objectively and decide whether or not that they, you know, they the risk versus benefits. If it's too risky, then we don't allow it to be used. If benefits exceed risk, then it's allowable under certain circumstances. 
and that those circumstances are laid out in, in the label. And then those label instructions are part and parcel of the training that goes into training someone like Mr. Valancourt as to how to use the product properly. Okay, thank you. Being no more questions, we will move on to the next person on our list, which is Victoria Wally. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the committee. I am Victoria Wallach. I am the Communications and Government Relations uh, Manager at the Maine School Management and representing the Maine School Boards Association and the Maine School Superintendents Association. Um, we're testifying neither for nor against LD 519. Um, while some school districts have used non-selective herbicides on the school campuses, our best information is they are used very infrequently. Um, the main purpose would be to remove encroaching weeds and cracks on sidewalks or along the paths. Um, the more problematic part of this proposal is the restriction on school grounds, which you've already heard from um, Director Patterson can involve lands not associated with the school buildings, but outdoor areas used by our students. Um, and that happens a lot in terms of, of training fields, sports fields. So that's where our bigger issue is. Um, we think regulating these off school premises would be difficult to monitor and enforce. The fact that the ban applies to anything with 75 feet of school and previous have previous speakers have talked about this um, could mean an issue involving fields. Um, one can imagine that in certain instances, you would be attempting to regulate nearby private property. Um, the, the bottom line is we're all about student safety and, and it boils down very well in this argument. One is student safety in terms of keeping a child safe from, as the previous speaker said, coming home with poison ivy and keeping the child safe in terms of their contact with um, herbicides. And it's not an easy job, which is why we're neither for nor against, but we need to find and strike the final balance. And I thank you for your time this morning and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none. Again, thank you for your testimony. Moving thank on to you. Heather Spaulding. Uh, hello, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee. My name is Heather Spaulding, and I'm Deputy Director of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, MOSCA. MOSCA appreciates the opportunity to submit comments in support of this bill. We were so pleased about where this bill was headed during last year's legislati legislative session, and we hope you will carry on from that point and vote ought to pass. Um, there are so many bills focusing on pesticides in this session, and I wanted to make a request of all who are attending the hearings and work sessions. Um, I hope that people will stop referring to these issues as emotional issues, not based in science. People are calling for action on pesticides, not out of irrational emotion, but based on peer reviewed studies coming out each week. There's no need of patronizing concerned citizens with terms like hysteria and emotion. Um, we wanna protect children from all pesticides and toxic chemicals. And we especially appreciate this bill's emphasis on glyphosate as peer reviewed studies reveal the inherent threats it poses to human health and the environment. Biomonitoring studies have detected glyphosate in the urine samples of 70 to 93% of the US population. The EPA estimates that exposure to glyphosate residues in our food has increased four times over the past quarter century, and children are more likely to be exposed than adults, especially one to two year olds. The Center for Environmental Health conducted a study showing high levels of glyphosate in more than 70% of oat-based breakfast foods commonly served in K through 12 schools across the country. Um, I won't get into the, um, the conversation about um, the, the scientific studies um, showing that, uh, that Glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen with many other concerns, uh, human health and con uh, concerns. Um, 
and also the, the concern about um, buyers, uh, 10 to $12 billion lawsuits um, against folks who have contracted non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I, I also have in my written remarks, a bunch of information and references to studies on the adverse effects of glyphosate on um, the environment. Um, but I did wanna thank Mr. King also for sharing his story about his son Blake's struggle with poison ivy. I have two kids who struggle with eczema, asthma, and nut allergies, and they've struggled all their lives. It's like a lifetime case of poison ivy, and it's horrible, it's severe, it's awful, it's just terrible. And I know that ordinances throughout Maine generally include exemptions for public health concerns. Um, I would hope that any synthetic synthetic chemicals truly would be used as an absolute last resort after non-toxic mechanical and soil amendments had been tried. We generally just want to advocate for a precautionary approach rather than relative risk. And we hope that Maine schools will adopt organic land care management practices. Um, as we've heard from other um, people who have testified in other pesticide hearings this session. So I hope you will carry on where the 129th legislature left off and vote ought to pass on this bill. And thank you very much for the opportunity to testify in support of LD 519. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Julianne Smith, I'll give you one more try here at the bottom if you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate your patience. And, and the third uh, electronic device is a charm, I guess. My apologies. And good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Julie Ann Smith, and I am the Executive Director of the Maine Farm Bureau Association. We are the state's largest farmer-run advocacy organization and have represented the voice of all agriculture in Maine since 1951. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to serve as the voice of our farmers today to oppose LD 519. Maine Farm Bureau's legislative committee meets on a weekly basis to discuss bills that will impact Maine's agricultural industry. Maine Farm Bureau's farmer members spent a significant amount of time discussing this bill and the issue of pesticide use. After much thoughtful discourse, our farmer members voted to oppose this bill. Maine's farmers are deeply concerned about the health and well being of their farm workers and children. However, we believe that this bill serves to add to the public misperception of the toxicity of herbicides, both synthetic and organic, that are absolutely necessary for the use of successful crop production, and when applied appropriately with the, within the requirements of best management practices, can be used safely without negative health impacts. While the bill is intended to exempt farms, farmers ha that have rented fields or property borders within the 75 uh, feet of school grounds will be negatively impacted. This bill's attempt to ban the use of synthetic herbicides on school grounds is dangerous for farmers. Furthermore, schools are not required to use non-selective herbicides. Schools are allowed to make the decisions they feel are in the best interest of their students and community, following the guidelines of the Board of Pesticide Control and Integrated Pest Management. If schools choose to use glyphosate or other herb herbicides, um, that should be their choice, not a decision made by legislation. As some of you may recall in the early 1990s, a similar ban, legislative ban, was adopted on LR and resulted in the immediate loss of nearly one third of the apple industry in Maine. It is imperative for the decisions of Maine's Board of Pesticide Control, which are rooted in carefully researched science, be respected. We have seen the negative impacts of creating legislation based on public perception rather than scientific fact and urge the committee not to repeat history. We would also like to pose questions about how, if this bill were to pass, school gardens and test fields, such as those managed by Cooperative Extension, would be impacted. We would also further ask whether there have been any documented cases of students being exposed to pesticides on school grounds and that exposure having a direct negative impact. We urge the committee to vote ought not to pass, and I thank you for your time and service to the people of Maine, especially our farmers, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions for, yes, uh, Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. Thank you for being here today. 
I, I was just thinking about, and to follow up on a question I asked earlier, a 75 foot setback. Uh, if I'd done my, if I'd done my math correctly, that's re- 580 linear feet. If you own a farm next to a, next to a, a school property, and if you have 580 feet of joint property line, 75 foot setback, that's an acre. And you can do the math and make it longer or whatever. But what is that acre worth in some respects to that farmer uh, who may be producing crops? And that setback, what impact might that have on their uh, economy? And would it be better to perhaps a couple of questions. Second question, would it better perhaps be that the school be responsible for designating an area that uh, is a no student zone, so to speak, rather than put the onus on the property owner? You understand what I'm saying? And I appreciate your comment. Thank you so much, Representative Schofield. And I, I think um, that is a brilliant idea. I mean, rather than saying, okay, the property line is a determinant. If we put the onus on the schools to say, okay, we understand that there is a potato field next to our, our school and abutting our property line. We wanna make sure that that farmer can produce those crops in the most effective and efficient way possible. Uh, we don't wanna impact their crop production because that obviously is going to um, affect their productivity and their profitability. And if they're not profitable, then we no longer have a farm next to us. So I I think that is, you know, an excellent recommendation and and certainly hope that the committee will consider that. Thank you. Next is Senator Maxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you, Ms. Smith for coming today. Do you, do you know how many farms would actually be affected by this bill? I, I do not have records of how many farms about um, school properties, no. Do those records exist somewhere? I'm sure I could call every town in the state of Maine and, and get that, those records, but that would be fairly time consuming. Mm. Um, I agree that would be very, very time consuming. I think I'm just trying to get a sense of, of, um, of how many farms this would, this would actually impact. And, um, and I was also wondering if you, um, if you've talked with the sponsor at all, it sounds like the sponsor has been really careful about exempting agricultural uses and trying to accommodate farmers and wondering if you've had the chance to, um, to dig into that with, with representative Gramlich. I have not had the opportunity to speak with a sponsor about it. Okay, thank you. Representative McCray. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good to see you, Ms. Smith. Uh, my, my question is the first concern that you spoke of was that uh, farmers really didn't have a problem with this bill having to do with school grounds and school children, but they were concerned about the promotion of an attitude of uh, not using pesticides, which farmers have to use, okay? But the public perception would be, would be advanced against pesticides if we did this on school grounds. And I mean, we're talking kids and stuff like this. We're not talking about crops. That, that concern, the number one that you mentioned, was the public perception that would be fortified that would be advanced by this bill. Could you speak to that, please? Thank you. Well, that, that was the concern raised by our farmers in our discussion. Right. You know, they, they feel very frustrated that the tools that they need to produce their crops to feed the world um, are constantly under attack because there's a misunderstanding. Yes, these products are toxic. They have to be. The whole point is that you're eliminating a weed or something. You are eliminating something that is, would otherwise be attacking that crop that is intended to grow and feed people. So when you're using the word toxic, that has a very different meaning within the scientific community than it does in the general public. And we don't see a need in the same way that we don't see a need to 
outright ban any sort of synthetic product or organic product or a product just because it is toxic. What we're seeing is, you know, there, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear mongering. And so rather than feeding into that fear, let's use the tools that we have and ask the legislature to use the tools that they have and say, you've got the board of pesticide control. You have experts, excellently, very brilliant people. I mean, Megan Patterson is one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. Um, she can tell you what the science is, what the reality is, what the problems are. And she's very honest about those things. So since the Board of Pesticide Control has not said, look, we, we think that this is terrible and synthetic pesticides and herbicides should be banned on school grounds, it, it is confusing to our farmers why the legislature feels that that should be done. And that eventually by, by saying, okay, well, we should ban on school grounds, the concern is that then, all right, it should be banned on farms as well. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your testimony. Um, I wanted to see if um, for the work session, just because your, your members are such a great broad network to draw on, could you and Mr. Flannery both and, and anyone else listening that might represent farmers come back with, um, with examples of folks who abut? So I think that would be super helpful for us to get an idea of how many, where they are, you know, and that, that'll help our process. I will do my best, absolutely. Thank you. Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. Also, I was just wondering your thoughts, ma'am, about schools and universities who do research in, in forestry and agriculture, research in the use of these, these herbicides and other things of that nature, these chemicals. Uh, do you think this bill would, would end up impacting that research and, and prohibiting that to be done? Your thoughts? We absolutely are very concerned about that. I mean, cooperative extension, that is based in the University of Maine. The University of Maine is a school. Um, I do not see in this language that the university would be excluded from this. So uh, a broad reading of it um, would certainly make us concerned that Cooperative Extension would not be able to conduct um, any further testing or use of synthetic um, products on, on their test fields. And, and that would be detrimental to our farmers. Thank you. Representative Blucher. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify that the school is defined in the bill as any public, private, or tribally funded elementary school, secondary school. Uh, it does not apply to schools of higher learning. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Seeing no more questions, I have no one else left to testify. So I will close the hearing on LD519. And just to give us a little break from pesticides for a second, uh, Senator Maxwell. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just hoping to make a, a statement before we moved on. If, if a there's statement a statement on this bill or a request for something for the work session or what? Um, just on, on our committee dynamic and process right now. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm feeling like there are, there are some dynamics happening in the committee that I feel like are really um, destructive and not helpful to the public process. I think having folks coming and testify and saying that we are, are fear mongering or asking inappropriate questions or that we are off base when we're trying to ascertain where folks are coming from is, is not appropriate. I think that's the exact purpose of us being here as legislators. Um, and I, I know I, um, this is not a direct comment at you, Senator Dill, but um, you know, calling, calling some of these lines of questioning emotional is just, is really inappropriate and frankly kind of sexist. And I just, um, I'm quite at my limit with all of this and I just needed to say it. Well, I guess that was directed at me, even though you said it wasn't. So, um, thank you for your comments, uh, uh, Senator Maxman. And I think, uh, emotion, men can have emotions just like women. I was not pointing fingers or be trying to be sexist here at all, I just felt that sometimes the line of questioning 
was, uh, um, you know, getting out of hand. And to me, it seemed emotional because tempers were flaring and tempers to me is an emotion. And it is not restricted to women. Men can have emotions too. So thank you for your comments. Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dell. Speaking of emotions, I can be very emotional. And sometimes I uh, recognize that and it gets out of hand. But I do certainly want to, I want to tell you that I appreciate your comments earlier. I believe that these folks come to us. They're citizens of our state. They come to us for the most part unpaid. They are they are they are expressing a point of view that they feel strongly about, and I think that we should try our best to question them and listen to them and uh, be part of the dialogue and the discussion without getting into any emotion or any form of. Uh, anger and I have to control myself from time to time. I recognize oh, it. Yeah. I just oh, want to say that I appreciate that. <laughs> and I guess I'm being talked over, so I'll stop. Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do appreciate the comments you had earlier because I was uh, getting emails and comments from the general public uh, in, and I've had many over the last couple, three weeks where uh, this committee has become a committee that tends to uh, allow badgering and, and intimidation of some of our uh, people that come here uh, to express their concerns. And I think that we need to, no matter which side we're on, we need to be very respectful of the people that are testifying and, and not badger or uh, put them in the corners or whatever. If we've got to ask questions, that's fine, but we need to treat them with respect. And I think at times we have not done that in this committee. Thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to thank everybody for, um, for what they raised and um, just wanted to jump in because I thought um, it would be good to, um, I think, what I'm thinking as I'm listening is I want to say that um, I'm open to to feedback personally. If anybody wants to to talk at any point about um, about something I've said or about something that's gone on in committee, um, and to think about um, whether it was respectful and, and make a suggestion about um, what would have looked differently. Um, and something I wanted to raise as well is that um, we are elected to to be here and to ask hard questions and to, um, to be here on behalf of Maine people so that, um, so that we can um, get questions answered, do our business, um, uncover information. And I think that's part of what our role is. And um, I think sometimes when we're on the other side of issues, it might feel like another person is, you know, being, inappropriate or, or rude, but it's, um, it's part of our work here is, is to ask questions and, and represent people. And, um, and I think sometimes it can feel disruptive when we're not used to certain questions being asked. Um, but I think, I don't know, if I look at my tone right now, I, I feel I have a lot of respect for all of you and, um, and that it's my goal to, to treat you and anyone that comes to this committee that way. So anyway, I'm open to, open to feedback. If you want to talk about anything specific off mic, um, happy to do that. But I do want to reaffirm that um, that's why we're here is to ask questions and, and have conversations that are hard. So. Thank you. Are there any other comments before we move on? All right. Seeing none, we're going to move on to LD 728. Um, I believe that Senator Black is the sponsor of this. It's resolved directing state agencies that maintain public lands for recreation to make certain information readily available to the general public. And I know he's got sap to boil at some point today, so we'll move him up in the queue here so we can uh, deal with this particular bill. Senator Black. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, I have got a busy day. It's going to be a long night. And so uh, um, if all of our bills today go as long as uh, this one did, we'll be here for a while. So I appreciate you moving me ahead. Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Committee on Ag, Conservation and Forestry. I am Senator Russell Black, and I represent Senate District 17. I am here today to present LD 728. The resolve directing state agencies to maintain public lands for recreation to make certain information is readily accessible to the general public. I was approached to put this resolve in by the Sportsman Alliance of Maine, and I did so because I believe it is important for the individuals to know where the public lands are located in Maine and how that land can be used or what it can be used for. Um, this information should be made readily available to the public. Since putting this resolve together, I have learned that the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife recently developed an online tool that is available to the public that displays maps and information on public lands and that they can be used for and how to access them. Also, the Sportsman Alliance of Maine, IFNW, and the Bureau of Public Lands have had productive conversations about making this information even more available to the public. Having learned all this, I do not believe this resolve is any longer needed, but I would like to see ask the committee if they would consider uh, the agencies reporting back to us with some kind of a letter or a resolve next year on how this is progressing. Thank you, and I'd be willing to try to answer any questions you have. Uh, at this point. So I, I have no one else on the list to uh, testify on this bill anyway, Senator Black. So if I hear you right, you'd like to go right into work session um, eventually after we close the hearing um, and kill the bill, but also then have us on a separate motion direct us to send a letter to um, the department, just asking them to pack, you know, to come back to us next year with what's happening in this area. Is that what I heard you say? That, that's what I would uh, suggest uh, because it's completely up to the committee what they want to do and where they want to go with this. Okay, thank you. Representative Schofield. Yeah, I would, I would move that we uh, do as this good Senator just recommended. And I think it's important for us to get feedback from the uh, department, the bureau, uh, I know I've had some examples and people have asked me questions about certain areas and sometimes it's difficult to, to, uh, to find that information out. So I think this, this, this concept has merit and I am glad to hear from the Senator that, they, that they're working on it. And I think that if they would report back to us, that would be a good thing. So I, I would move that we proceed with that. All right, uh, we can do that as soon as we get out of the uh, work session if we want to go into, uh, I mean, go into work session, we'll get out of the public hearing first. Uh, anything, so if you want to hold that, Representative Schofield, we'll, uh, yes. but I'll continue discussion if there's any other discussion on this. Seeing none, I will close the work session on LD 728, and then I would call on Representative Schofield to um, suspend the rules to make a motion, suspend the rules and go into work session first. If you would do that. Senator Dill, I move that we suspend the rules and go into work session. Thank you. Representative I will Hall. second that. I'll All second right. that motion. We are in work session on LD 728. Representative Schofield. I move, I move that we uh, proceed with sending the department a letter uh, requesting that they report back on whatever contingencies that they develop over the next year uh, and have that for us at the next session. I okay. think that's, I think that encapsulates what I want to do. Thank okay, you. So that, that's the latter part of it. And we will, we, we'll, we'll deal with that. Is there a Point second? Order. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, do we need to take a vote on going into work session and suspending the rules? Oh, sorry. Actually, we didn't have to suspend the rules. I think we put that in the rules anyway, but yes, yeah, sure. Oh, right. apologies. Just raise your hand to go ahead and go into work session. Thank you for that. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to send a letter to the department regarding this issue. Is there any discussion on that? 
Karen, do you want to go out not to pass first before we do a letter? Uh, yeah, you could just roll it all into one motion if, if that's the intent. If that's the intent. I will move, I move out not to pass with a letter being sent as a follow-up. Okay, sounds good. And that's okay with you, Representative Paul, for your second? Yes, it is. Yes. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Cheryl, would you please call the roll? Yes, I will. LD 728. Resolve directing state agencies that maintain public lands for recreation to make certain information readily accessible to the general public. Ought not to pass with a letter going to the department. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas, Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Absent. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford. Yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford. Yes. Representative David McCray. Yes. Representative David McCray. Yes. Representative Susan Bernard. Absent. That's 11 ought not to pass. <clears throat> absent. <clears throat> 11 ought not to pass with two absent. It's ought not to pass on LD 728, a resolve directing state agencies that maintain public lands for recreation to make certain information readily accessible to the general public. And so we'll close the work session on this and we'll move back into public hearing on LD 524, an act requires schools to submit pest management activity logs to the Board of Pesticide Control and the posting of inspection results for the purpose of providing information to the Public. And with that, let's see. Who, that is Senator Daughtry. Senator Daughtry, yes, I see her on the bottom here. Welcome, Senator. Good morning. Thank you, Senator Dill. You guys have had quite the morning. Um, so without further ado, uh, good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Maddie Daughtry, and I'm the State Senator for Senate District 24, which includes the towns of Brunswick, <coughs> Oxwell, North Yarmouth, and Connell. And I live in Brunswick, and I'm here to present LD 524, an act to require schools to submit pest management activity logs to the Board of Pesticides Control and the posting of inspection results for the purpose of providing information to the public. And I dare anyone to try saying that three times fast. So I come before you with this bill. It's another iteration of many different bills that have been before you, as well as I think a nice tie to the bill that you just heard uh, previously um, dealing with pesticides on school grounds. Many of you have heard my personal story of how I got involved in this when I was in high school um, in 2001, a bunch of students, we had an improper application of sprayed pesticides on a windy day. And that was my first sort of uh, iteration of getting involved in making sure that there's proper notification, proper procedures, and also making sure that the public is aware of what's going on. Since roughly 2003, the experience that I went through is something that wouldn't happen. Um, you know, I know all of you on this committee are aware of the practices and required notifications for schools and also the work that the Board of Pesticide Control has done as well. But this bill is seeking to sort of further build upon that rule in the chapter that was adopted to provide notification regulations and really try to find what methods to improve and increase communication about when these methods are used. 
It's you know meant to find a way that if someone is wondering if a certain product or pesticide has been applied or what you know procedures have been taken, that the public and potentially other facilities maintenance folks can look at the different school sites or at lo uh, centrally located state site as well to be able to see what's going on. Unfortunately, the draft that's in front of you uh, was a bit lost in translation and needs a few major changes. <laughs> Um, first off, there is no public health exemption mentioned in the text of the bill. This is something that I know when dealing with these items that has been brought up from folks who are, you know, working in our schools that sometimes you have to act fast. I think this has been made clear during the pandemic that sometimes, you know, you don't have the proper time to turn around and have quick notifications. So I want to make sure that how much, however this bill moves forward, that a public health exemption is placed in there. Also, I want to be clear that disinfectants are not included in this, nor are they meant to be included. Um, I'm sure you've all followed what our schools and our businesses, even our legislature is going through to meet COVID safety protocols and making sure that disinfectants are being used to keep us safe. So I just wanted to, you know, say for the record that the intent of this is to not have disinfectants involved at all. Additionally, from talking from you know, advocates and folks in the field, it's clear that you know, a once a year reporting deadline doesn't really make sense and doesn't really accomplish the goal. So I've met with members of the Educational Plant Maintenance Association. So these are the people you know, right there on the front lines doing this work every day to hear their concerns and their ideas. And they agreed that there's definitely a need for increased communication. And actually, you know, as long as disinfectants weren't involved, actually came up with a couple of ideas that I wanted to put before the committee to just sort of consider. You know, all of them talked about the fact that there's very few inspections. One talked about, um, you know, we only have two folks in the state, if I do believe in the department, who go to the schools to check these logs. And that, you know, most schools are only getting inspected every 11 years. So they wanted to see if there was any way that we can give, you know, increased support to our department to make sure that they're checking in with the people doing this work. Because all of them, you know, had examples of, you know, how they learned to do this or knowing that occasionally there's bad actors. So wondering how the department can be, you know, supported and have increased assets to be able to work with our facilities maintenance folks. Also, they are wondering, you know, what are the best practices and way to disseminate that? And also this, you know, gets into the local versus state control. Many of them wondered if there was a way to strongly encourage school districts to make this notice available on school websites where it's easily and clearly available, which some school districts are doing already. Um, you know, most of our school districts are doing integrated pest management. So the pesticides that this would cover, you know, really are mostly, you know, they talked about insect infestations is typically when this happens, but they also agree that they want um, the public to be aware of what they are doing on school grounds as a learning experience. Um, I've also spoken with the department about this bill and they had many of the same concerns that I had as well. And I know you'll be hearing from them later. Some of the ideas we discussed about how to sort of get to the goal of this is maybe looking at turning this bill into resolve to have um, either the department or the board of pesticide control look at the way to make this information publicly available and what the best methods are to accomplish that. Also perhaps looking at maybe limiting it to, you know, a few key pesticides that are the most toxic and carcinogenic for our school children um, and figuring out what are the best ways to make people aware of the risk within our school setting. I would be more than amenable to the idea of turning this into resolve to look into this, but mostly the heart and goal and the purpose of me being in front of you this morning is really to talk about how we make sure that people are aware when this is going on. You know, we get tons of notices when our students are going on field trips. You know, parents have to know, you know, what's going on with the school menu, what's going on with their homework. And I think that the public, you know, deserves the same, you know, ability to be able to see what pesticides and what practices are being used in our schools around our students. I know that, you know, the folks who are in the field agree and have the same desire. And my hope is that we can work together to find a way to just improve communication about what's being used in our school grounds. And with that, thank you for your time. Um, and I look forward to working with the committee and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you so much. Next is Kathy Murray from uh, Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. Good morning. 
Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. I am Kathy Murray. I'm the Integrated Pest Management Entomology Entomologist at the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, speaking in support of LD 524, an act to require schools to submit pest management activity logs and inspection results to the Board of Pesticides Control for the purpose of providing information to the public. The Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry is firmly committed to protecting people and the environment from pests and pesticides in all settings, especially in schools. The Board of Pesticide Control enforces state regulations specifically aimed at minimizing those risks on school properties. The school's integrated pest management program, uh, which I coordinate, provides uh, guidance, technical resources, training intended to help schools find effective solutions to prevent and manage pests and remain in compliance with those state and federal pesticide regulations. The Board of Pesticide Controls Rule Chapter 27, Standards for Pesticide Applications and Public Notification in Schools, is pretty stringent. All public and private schools are required to adopt IPM policies and practices, including pest monitoring, the use of non-pesticide pest prevention and control tactics, they have to keep records. A trained school staff member, um, they have specific training requirements that we provide for them, um, must serve as the IPM coordinator responsible for overseeing all pest prevention, pest sightings, and any management actions that are taken to manage pests or prevent pests. Pesticides can only be applied on school properties by a licensed professional applicator with routine, uh, with exceptions for routine disinfection and urgent stinging insect control. Schools are required to notify parents and staff and signs must be posted in advance of most pesticide applications done during the school year. Schools that fully implement all IPM strategies may never need to use pesticides. However, there are times when a judicious, targeted, well-timed, well-selected pesticide application used in combination with non-pesticide methods can be the most effective and least risky approach to managing a pest problem. For instance, the example of poison ivy that uh, came up earlier and hornets, uh, another one too. At present, Maine schools are required to maintain a pest management activity log using their own record keeping systems. These records must retain the specific name of each pest encountered, steps taken to determine that the action is needed to address a pest issue, all steps taken to address it, a list of pesticide applications conducted on the school grounds or in the buildings too, including the date, time, location, the trade name of the product applied, the EPA registration number, the name of the company licensed uh, app with the licensed applicator that's being contracted to apply that pesticides. Um, and if there is no EPA registration number for some products, some of those 25B products that we call it, some oftentimes they're um, organic products. They have to keep a record of those two, and they have to keep a, a copy of the label for that product in their records. Under current regulations, any parent or community member can view pest management and pesticide use records upon request of the school. In addition, the BPC inspection staff review these records at schools, and BP inspection reports are available upon request. I think it's more often that they, they do strive uh, to uh, inspect schools at least well, about once a year. I know they're definitely striving to that, um, but we can talk about that in uh, in later. Um, the LD 524 would enlarge the scope of schools reporting responsibilities by requiring that they provide pest management log activities to the BPC on an annual basis and for the BPC, the Board of Pesticide Control, to post the information on its publicly accessible website. It also requires that the board post a list of all the inspections of schools' use of pesticides and the results of those inspections. The department supports making these records more easily accessible to the general public because the bill allows for, well, because the bill allows for the board rulemaking surrounding this effort, staff anticipates that crafting a process with the school IPM coordinators that allows for an online data entry system would be efficient and more workable for all parties. One important area needing clarification, however, is the term species in this bill, um, in this proposed legislation. It's not clear, though uh, Senator Daughtry made some references that clarifies that a little bit, but just to point out um, that the existing uh, bill as it reads, 
it's not clear whether the term species means rodents, plants, and insects specifically. Um, as Senator Daughtry did mention, schools commonly use disinfectants, which are all classified as pesticides too, on a daily basis to disinfect food preparation surfaces, frequently touch surfaces like doorknobs and bathrooms of microbes. Um, these actions are well understood and expected in a school setting as they are in many, any restaurant you go to, or any, any setting where um, public health is of, of utmost importance. In a more broad definition, if a more broad definition is intended, it could make these reporting requirements really difficult um, and time consuming because of the daily nature of, of the use of these products of disinfectants. Uh, because there will be questions on how best to design and implement this online reporting requirement, the committee may consider changing this bill to a resolve, uh, directing the Board of Pesticide Control to research and implement workable methods for doing so in a manner that provides data in a clear and useful format. A couple of technical considerations that we'd like to highlight is that in the existing regulations, chapter 27, uh, the standards for school pesticide use, school grounds is defined in rule, but school property is not. And this bill makes reference to school property, not to school grounds. So that's a little inconsistent there. Another um, minor one is that the Board of Pesticide Control actually doesn't issue certification numbers for uh, pesticide applicators. There is a reference to that in this bill. It does issue licenses with license numbers. And um, so that could be clarified. The summary of the bill uh, implies that schools themselves make pesticide applications. Um, it, it says schools use of pesticides. Uh, as we pointed out earlier, pesticide applications on school grounds are typically made by commercial pesticide applicators. There are a couple of schools, a few schools that have a licensed applicator on staff, a master applicator license on staff, but the vast majority of our schools contract for those services with a commercial pesticide applicator contracted to do this work. So we suggest it would be better to state pesticides used on school grounds in the language rather than uh, school use of pesticides. Um, I would point out that this would be a fair amount of data management uh, to do this. It may be worth it, but uh, just to point out the work that would be involved, um, it would be transitioning to an online data management system. Currently schools use paper records. They get uh, service records on paper from their contracted service providers. Um, and they keep it in a logbook that can then easily be opened and inspected upon inspection. Um, if we're going, they are going to be tasked with transitioning and providing those data in an online data management system. It would require some work um, by the Board of Pesticide Control. It would take considerable resources, really, uh, to design, create, and implement uh, a system to accept those records. It would also take uh, an effort on the behalf of schools who typically these uh, school IPM coordinators, they're usually the facilities manager. Some of them are the school facilities, transportation and maintenance directors too. They are they carry a couple of telephones and a, a radio and then they're on call 24 seven. They've got a lot of things that they have to do. And they're juggling many duties in their daily schedules. They really oftentimes don't really have ready access to the technical and administrative support that would be required to readily transfer those records. They would have to rely on uh, support, of, support from their schools, technical and administrative staff to, to help do that. Um, it may be necessary for us to provide significant outreach and education to those school IPM coordinators to help them uh, understand and learn the process for converting to an online system. For I, that concludes my testimony. I thank you for your time and I'm hands, happy to answer any questions you may have now or at the work session. Are there any questions for Kathy? Seeing none, thank you, Dr. Murray. Sure. And uh, we'll move on to, who do I have on my list next? Julianne Smith and Victoria Wallet. Julianne Smith is not in the waiting room any longer. Okay. Um, but I will pr promote Victoria. I did send Julianne Smith a link to see if she was still going to join us. Good morning again. Would you introduce yourself, please? Um, 
I'm Victoria Wallach. Um, I represent um, the school superintendents and school boards association. I'm the communications director and government relations director for Maine School Management. Um, we really, uh, we were neither for nor against because we didn't, we were anticipating that something we had been told that an amendment was coming. And I would say that we would very much like to be part of this working group. All the, it is of course a good idea it to be transparent. I think Ms. Murray raised all the issues we would have raised in terms of this would be a whole way of different way of doing things. There would be data collection. There would have to be data input and creation of an online um, platform. What we would like, I don't, so we have a, a person on our staff who deals directly with these issues and I would like him to be part of a working group so that we could be at the table. But there certainly is a way to, to work with others to create transparency. Um, as she mentioned, anyone can come to the school now and request to see them, they're not a secret. Um, but pushing them out to the public, we would like to have a discussion around how that would work. And we also don't want to alarm people that don't understand what we're doing. Um, and that sometimes can happen. Um, so if there's a working group, we raise our hands and would love to be part of that to come up with a method to increase communication and address, uh, address concerns that have been raised. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you. Did uh, Julianne Smith uh, make it back? She had to leave for another meeting, so she okay. will not be here. Okay, then I will close the public hearing on LD 524 and open up the public hearing on LD 558. Uh, Direct, I resolve directing the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry to study alternative cropping systems for farmers affected by PFAS contamination. And that, I believe, is Representative Kluka's bill. Yes, it is. Good morning. Still morning, everybody. Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and all the other distinguished members of the ACF committee, thanks for all your work this morning. It's not been simple for any of us, complicated work we're doing on, a, on so many levels. I'm Representative Bill Pluker and I represent House District 95, which is Appleton Hope, part of the town of Union and Warren. Thank you for the opportunity to present LD 558, a resolution directed to DACF to study alternative cropping systems for farmers affected by PFAS contamination. The issue of PFAS contamination is a major concern in our agricultural community as we see acreage of contaminated, and of contaminated farmland increasing. Some of the farms that have been affected have already closed. If we not take action to address this issue, we'll see our farming community shrink as access to land will be constrained and we'll have to move off, off of our contaminated fields. Together, the department, industry, and, a policy, and us as a policy committee need to prepare ourselves for the work that is coming. The scope of this plan has yet to be determined. Today, I'm presenting a strategy to promote real alternatives and how we grow food and plants. We need to determine how we can utilize our land in a way that still returns an income from our land despite its contamination. The policy of attempting to remediate the land and water will quickly become prohibitively expensive. We need to study how to keep the land productive for the farmers who own it. And we don't wanna lose the key farming members of our community, key players in our farming community due to this contamination. We need to work on the fundamental resiliency and flexibility of Maine's farmers by creating a program that will allow them to continue to hold, to build their businesses under the most difficult of circumstances as likely, as are likely to occur when contamination is found. The bill, this bill will authorize a study to be carried out, carried out by the University of Maine in cooperation with the department to look into alternative agricultural entrepreneurship opportunities for affected farmers. The different opportunities to be studied may range from vegetable to livestock production, they could also study PFAS uptake rates from corn to zucchinis and feasible income alternatives from solar generation to nursery stock. When we, will, uh, when we have a strong program within the department that is ready to house the farmers under worst case scenarios, farmers will have the confidence to know that they can test their fields and they'll have alternatives to maintain their operation. We do not want to leave our farming community caught between a rock and a hard place when it comes to testing for contamination. 
believing that they will lose their family, potentially believing that they could lose, lose their family's way of life. We need to offer a program that is ready to answer their questions and give them the support in their recovery that they will need. Um, on this bill, I've been, I've been cooperating a lot with the department. Um, they will present their testimony today and I look forward to working the whole committee, working with them to make sure this bill is, is fit, fitting their needs and really fitting the needs that they've seen come out of the contamination as it's occurred on the different farms. Thank you so much to everybody. And I'm ready to ask questions if you have any. Are there any questions for Representative Luca? All right, uh, seeing none, my next three folks are uh, Caleb Goosen, Sarah Woodbury, and Sharon Treat. So Caleb, if you're out there, there we go. Hello, thank you. So thank you to the uh, chairs and the committee for considering this important topic uh, and for taking testimony today. My name is Caleb Goosen. I am the crop specialist for Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, a role that is similar to and often working in collaboration with UMaine Cooperative Extension. Uh, the need for research into PFAS contamination almost goes without saying. There are currently far more questions than answers, and accordingly, I support the general thrust of this bill. Uh, I have not worked with legislation before, but I do have experience with agricultural research. Uh, th this bill as written represents a potentially very large body of research, but suggests a timeline to deliver results and conclusions that would be very difficult to achieve satisfactorily. Uh, additionally, it's unclear to me what funding sources would be expected to be utilized for this very expensive line of research. Uh, so each individual sample can cost hundreds of dollars to have analyzed uh, for PFAS contamination. I would propose a more stepwise approach for consideration, an initial goal of research this year to address immediate questions which have already been raised by recent uh, DEP and extension research work. Uh, that would allow time for advanced planning of future research and crucially time for all of us involved to seek funding, including uh, the state legislature, I would hope. Uh, and that funding could be from federal or state resources. The funding really needs to be secured for the costly sample analysis, and I would also hope to compensate affected landowners that, uh, for their use of their time and the property uh, where this research would hopefully be taking place to, in order to be performed under real world and applied conditions. I'm happy to discuss the topic further, should any committee members be so inclined, and thanks again for taking your time with this topic. Thank you. Are there any questions? Representative Pluker. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Goosen. Would you, um, we're, we're uh, planning on, on working uh, with the department. I'm putting together a little, just, just as you said, a little bit more narrowed focus to make sure we're really targeting what we need to do. Would you be willing to be part of that conversation? Yes, and I, I may unofficially already be part of that conversation. I, I was talking uh, recently with Rick Kurzberg and, and Andy Smith at DEP. Great, thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. And we'll move on to who's next? Um, Sarah Woodbury. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it is still good morning. I've got nine minutes left. Um, so good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Agriculture Conservation and Forestry Committee. My name is Sarah Woodbury. I'm the Director of Advocacy Defend Our Health, formerly known as the Environmental Health Strategy Center. Um, our mission is to make sure that everyone has equal access to safe food, safe drinking water, healthy homes, and toxic-free climate-friendly products. Uh, we are here. I'm here to testify in support of LD 559. This resolve would direct the department in consultation with, with U of M to study alternative cropping systems that are more cost effective than soil and water remediation systems for farmers whose lands have been contaminated by perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS. 
Nearly every person in the US from newborns to seniors have toxic PFAS in their blood. It is a persistent chemical that does not break down and can remain in the human body and in the environment for years. They are called a forever chemical for, the re for a reason. We are exposed to these toxic chemicals in a variety of products, including food packaging, cooking supplies, clothing, and furniture. It has been linked to several health um, impacts, including diminished response to vaccines and harm to the immune system. Certainly you have seen the stories in both the local and national news about the farmers and other landowners who have been impacted by the issue of PFAS contamination in Maine. The Stone Ridge farm in Arundel was the first farm in the state to find incredibly high levels of PFAS in their milk. This 100 year old dairy farm has been destroyed by PFAS contamination. The Tozier farm in Fairfield found levels of PFAS in their cow's milk that was likely the highest found in North America. Additionally, at least 54 wells around the Tozier farm have been found to be, have extremely high levels of PFAS. And this is just the tip of the toxic iceberg. The number of contaminated farms and wells will continue to grow as DCAF and DEP do more testing. The list of farmers who find themselves impacted will also continue to grow. Farmers are experiencing these issues through no fault of their own. They were assured by the state that the spreading of biosolids on their land was safe, economical, and even a public service to their communities. They did their part and now we need to help them. We need to come up with alternatives to help the farmers impacted by this contamination. It should not just be up to the farmers to come up with solutions to deal with the contamination of their land by chemicals that most probably have never even heard of. Both DCAF and DEP should be giving them guidance and support to figure out the best ways for these farmers to move forward and to continue to support themselves and their families while remaining on their farms. Additionally, without programs and resources in place, many farmers will be hesitant to get their farms tested and will be less motivated to address the issue. This bill helps address those concerns by showing those impacted farmers that the state is working to come up with alternatives, allowing them to continue to work and make a living off the land that they love and for many has been in their family for generations. Therefore, Defend Our Health urges the committee to vote unanimously ought to pass on LD 558. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Woodbury? All right. Seeing none, I will move on to Sharon Treats. Long time no see. Good, good at, I'm still, still learning. Okay. Yes, it's <laughs> really great to see you, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and honorable members of the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee. My name is Sharon Treat, and I live in Hollowell. And I'm senior attorney now for the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, and I'm testifying today in support of LD 558. IATP is a nonprofit headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but we have an office here in Hollowell and other locations. We work closely with farmers to promote local, sustainable, and environmentally beneficial agriculture. And we've been working on PFAS issues as they have risen to the fore as a significant agricultural problem, and not just here in Maine, by the way. Far, Maine farmers have learned the hard way that PFAS threatens their health and livelihoods and the viability of their farms. As you've heard, two Maine farms have been forced to close their operations because of dairy and beef contamination from these toxic chemicals. Attempts to clean up and remediate PFAS contaminated farmland have proven to be both ineffective and outrageously expensive. Meanwhile, farmers have lost their livelihoods and have had to kill their livestock. Their water is undrinkable and unsafe and financial assistance has not yet been forthcoming. This resolve and the study that it would initiate would be an important step in understanding how farm produce and livestock is affected by PFAS and identifying potential health, both technical and financial for farmers who may, are or may be affected in the future. Other states are engaged in PFAS research through their universities. The Colorado College of Mines is researching how PFAS and irrigation water could taint produce. Connecticut's PFAS plan recommends that their agricultural experiment station research PFAS detection in soils and foods. The University of North Dakota has secured, and this may be something we could think about, a half million dollar grant from EPA to develop practical strategies for removing PFAS from groundwater. We have to take this contamination seriously, firstly, to protect the health of farmers, their neighbors and, and customers, and secondly, to assure that Maine's reputation for safe, wholesome and sustainably grown food remains intact. Sadly, it is possible that other farms could already be contaminated or might be in the future, as these forever chemicals move great distances through groundwater 
far from the original source of contamination and as in Fairfield may be traced back to actions such as sludge spreading that took place more than 17 years ago and perhaps farther back. May DEP has also found numerous instances of PFAS contamination in groundwater and wells near landfills and has records for um, 500 or so sludge spreading sites, most of which have not been tested. Ideally, the federal government should be leading this effort. However, the federal response has been inadequate and has not been directed at agricultural impacts and solutions. USDA has been slow to get involved, even though it has significant financial resources that could be brought to bear. Maine CDC is already in the forefront of agronomic PFAS research and Commissioner Beal has taken the lead among state agriculture commissioners to advocate nationally for action with the, um, the Association of State Ag Groups. Um, this resolve could help Maine move ahead with our own re research while identifying best practices to help impacted farmers and making the case for funding and federal assistance. And I would just refer you to my um, written testimony, but also just to add that I, I totally agree with the comments that this is a very uh, comprehensive and, and complex and uh, very, would require a lot of um, different research things. But I do think it could be a great vehicle for figuring out where we move ahead on that kind of phase basis that you've just heard as a suggestion. And I'd be happy to work with you uh, on, on that as well. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Representative McCray. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'll be quick. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Treat, for being here. You mentioned landfills, and that I was like, like a dog. My ear kind of perked up inside. Uh, we have a, a very large landfill in my district, uh, actually in my town, but also in my district. Uh, and the leachate, I've been on our town council, so I'm a little bit familiar with those reports, mm -hmm. et cetera. And the leachate, is probably where these PFASs are going to end up. So we've gone through all kinds of stuff and we have captured that leachate, but it's got to go somewhere. So it is taken to a treatment center, a, 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 a sewer treatment system, a big one. These are forever chemicals, as I understand it. Is there anything that is happening in a treatment center, a sanitation treatment center, that is going to break these PFASs down or are they really forever chemicals? Well, this is the, this is the, the problem because then it goes into the sewage sludge. So, and that sewage sludge, you know, has to be disposed of. And so what has been a practice in Maine and everywhere else in the country has been spreading that on the land, which of course, causes the problem in the first place that we're trying to fix right here. So, you know, this is a big problem and, and more money needs to be put into actually like um, mechanisms for, for um, destroying PFAS in there's some chemical processes that are under consideration. A lot of the municipal waste burning doesn't work. Um, and so, and, and, and again, you know, often merely transfers the problem to somewhere else because if you're burning something then it ends up um, in air deposition. And it, it, in my um, written testimony, I have links to some of the DEP's research around this that they presented to the governor's PFAS commission, but they found test results for fish in Northern Maine, like away from the landfills, like in remote, um, remote uh, lakes that are contaminated with PFAS. So where's it coming from? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I mean, one thing that maybe is a positive sign is that the new head of the DEP um, comes from, uh, head of the EPA nationally comes from um, North Carolina where they've been trying to deal with PFAS pollution there and maybe more focused and interested in like dealing with it than we've had in the past. But the, I have to say that the research that I've seen nationally is there's been very little attention to the ag part of this. And that's one reason I think this bill is really important, not only to do our own research, but also to push nationally uh, to, to get them to focus on it. Thank you very much for such a good answer. Are there other questions? Seeing none. Thank you for your testimony this morning. You're welcome. And I will go back to Nancy McBrady. And I missed you. I didn't have you on my list. And I actually didn't see you in the waiting room. So I do apologize for skipping over you. Uh, 
That's quite all right. Good afternoon, Senator Dill. And I think the, uh, the the root cause is that I was watching on YouTube and I think there's a little bit of a delay, so I will uh, avoid that <laughs> next time around. Um, so without further ado, uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill and members of the committee, I am Nancy McBrady. I am the Director of the Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources in the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. I'm here today to speak neither <clears throat> for nor against LD 558. Um, but we're, we're very supportive. Um, the discovery of PFAS contamination in Maine has highlighted the critical need for research on the impacts, environmental and agronomic fate, and future remediation of PFAS in agricultural settings. Although PFAS research is being conducted worldwide, it is still in its infancy, particularly regarding agriculture. The department appreciates Representative Pluker's efforts to direct state research towards projects that will ideally identify viable farming alternatives for PFAS impacted farms and farmers in Maine. LD 558 currently suggests a wide range of studies for the department to undertake, ranging from greenhouse studies to looking at pH and salinity of water to ruminant grazing on dual use solar energy projects on contaminated sites. We don't disagree that a variety of research projects is needed and will ultimately help farmers determine if alternative cropping systems could work on their lands. However, our department, as well as the Maine Department of Environmental Protection and the Maine Centers for Disease, Disease Control and Prevention, who are our critical research partners, are limited in our ability to quickly manage and execute numerous research studies and also don't have readily available sources of funding on hand to carry out additional research. We recommend that the intent of the resolve would best be met if the department and its agency and research partners be requested to craft a robust research study plan that covers research topic areas, study needs, possible roles of state agencies and research collaborators to conduct the work, propose timeframes, propose budget, and target sources of funding. The department would submit the report for the 130th second session that allows the committee to report out legislation. But meanwhile, and very importantly, I wanna stress, our current research efforts will continue. And just briefly touching on what those are, over the past two years, data collection and assessment has been undertaken to enhance the main CDC's models used to derive soil screening levels that DEP is using and also helping farmers use the data to make decisions about potential future crops that could or could not be um, grown on those sites. Getting more data helps main CDC to derive plant uptake factors, helping ascertain the level at which certain crops may contain PFAS or other types of PFAS or other types of PFAS, excuse me. To date, these efforts have focused specifically on the transfer of PFOS, PFAS, from soil to hay, grass, and from soil to corn silage. The interim results have allowed us to advise farms which fields can be used for farming, uh, hay, corn, silage, earlage, or grain, and which to be avoided entirely. This important research lays the foundation for helping potentially secure farm viability and is otherwise threatened by PFAS contamination. And then I have some detail here uh, about the soil and grass studies um, that I can walk you through, but also would mention if at work study, at, at the work session, um, we can have uh, DEP and CDC folks talk about it as well in greater detail. So for the soil and grass studies to date, we've found plant transfer factors for PFAS for soil to grass that are four to five times higher than two other published field studies only two other published field studies. This goes to the point that more studies need to be done. CDC does not yet have a clear explanation for why they are seeing higher plant transfer factors. But one hypothesis is that this is a result of the grass being a cut crop where the roots have been established for years on end. And also 2020 was a very dry year and perhaps climate conditions are having an impact. In addition, DEP and CDC have obtained 10 co-located soil and corn silage samples from two fields which provide plant transfer factors for PFOS for, sorn, for soil to corn silage that are in the general range of one published report found to date. They also have samples of corn kernels, which were non-detect for PFOS despite being in high soil levels, consistent with one published study. This is encouraging data, but Maine CDC needs to look more closely at the data for other PFOS as well. There is no doubt that more research must be done to assist farmers facing PFOS contamination. Given our two years of experience to date on the ground with farmers, we believe it is imperative to focus on alternative cropping system research. 
To that end, it is anticipated that our research proposal will build upon the soil, grass, and corn studies conducted to, to date. However, because of the important link linkage between feed crops and livestock operations, such as dairy and beef, we would recommend looking at other types of grain and grasses as well, the point being what they would feed those other livestock to. At the work session, as I mentioned previously, other agency representatives can go into greater detail about these potential research areas. And I'd also mention that DEP would likely pursue additional modeling work to assess leaching to groundwater impacts from PFAS. LD558 currently requests DF, our department to focus on dual use solar monitoring. We would be happy to assess potential solar studies for a research plan, but do wanna note that the department is currently working with the governor's energy office to determine the best path for making developers aware of potential locations and focusing opportunity for solar development at PFAS impacted farms. Our research study planning effort could also assess the value in pursuing greenhouse related studies and other area, areas of interest. So to summarize, LD558 identifies and prioritizes the urgent need to pursue PFAS agricultural research for the benefit of PFAS impacted farms. We believe LD558 would be most effective if it allows the department along with its sister agencies to fully design a robust research study plan that will provide a roadmap for critically important research studies to assist farmers in Maine for years to come. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Pluker. Thank you for being here, Director McGrady. Um, would you be willing to work with me and our analyst, Karen, to put together some language that would work for the department uh, between now and the work session? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Are uh, there any other questions for Director McGrady? All right, seeing none, I have no one else on uh, my list to testify. So I will close the hearing on LD558. And we'll go on to LD691. And I will open the, the hearing on LD691 uh, and act to support farms and address food insecurity. And Representative Pluker, you're up again. Thank you very much to everyone for enduring past our lunch hour here. Um, thank you to the entire committee, Senator Dill and Representative Neal for the chance to present LD 691, an act to support farms and address food insecurity. This bill is a close mirror image of a bill that we saw in the last session and that made it through the House and the Senate um, and then eventually died on the appropriations table um, when we left Augusta due to COVID. This is a bill that supports a program that we have been using on my farm for over a decade to support our community and build our business. In cooperation with MAFCA, Maine Organic Farmers and Gardens Association, we provide a 50% discount to any SNAP beneficiaries who come to our farm to buy a CSA share. The funds to make this happen come from the federal government and are funneled through MAFCA to us as the farmers to match the funds that the SNAP beneficiaries pay to us for their vegetables. So it's a little bit of a complicated weave process that I'm happy to explain to the committee as we go. The difficulty lies in the administration of these grants and in the fundraising, the matching grants needed by MAFCA to qualify for the federal grants. So MAFCA needs to, needs, to needs to privately fundraise for matching grants to the federal funds, which are then funneled back to the farmer. For every dollar that comes from the federal government, MAFCA must fundraise and match it. MAFCA can use very few of these dollars for administration, and there are often lag times between the delivery of the funds from the federal government, during which the organization in this case, MAFCA, but there's also many others in the state which work with this program, must continue to administer the program. As we've seen during COVID, the ability to fundraise for the good, for the food, for the food insecure folks in our state cannot keep up with the demand upon the system. The purpose of this bill is to create a state fund that can help to ease the burden on nonprofits like MAFCA so that we can help these funds coming into the state for the benefit of farmers and the food insecure alike. To be clear, my farm partners with MAFCA because they oversee the program for CSAs. Our farm runs a CSA program, but several other nonprofits profits administer aspects of the program in the state, like the Maine Federation of Farmers Markets, Maine Farmland Trust, and others. This year, these programs are partnered with the federal FINI program, but next year, the rules and administration of the program will undergo a relatively major change to the GUSNIP program. Uh, if you would like details on the differences between the two programs, please ask some of those who are going to follow me today. Both. Nevertheless, the new program is largely intended to achieve the same goals as the original program, just with a new set of rules. Both are federal programs. I believe both are coming out of the USDA. 
Well, the, I'm hoping my my phone there isn't too distracting. The message should be over soon. Okay. While the original vision version of this bill was sitting on the AFA table in 2020, in partnership with Mar Maine Farmland Trust, we managed to secure the backing of a private foundation. The foundation was willing to match any funds that the state was able to put into the program. For every dollar the state invested, we doubled it with private dollars, which were doubled by federal dollars, which were then doubled again by SNAP beneficiaries dollars. For every dollar spent by the state, almost $8 ended up in farmers sales to food and secure people. The economic power of the program cannot be overstated. Due to COVID, the private foundation's backing is no longer available. We are also in doubt as to the ability of the state to fund any extra dollars for a new program, even one as promising as this one. For this reason, we would like to hold this bill in committee till next session so that we may continue to work with private foundations that are interested in our work and with luck find, it, find, it, find an appropriations table more adequately equipped to support new programming. Um, we have foundations that may be interested in supporting us again, depending on the economy in the new year. We'll also have a year to get the new federal goosenet program up and running in the state. We hope they will have your support at that time to get this program, our farmers, and food insecure people the support they need by 2020. And it, that's been a, that's a, there's a lot of moving parts in that testimony, so I'm very happy to answer any questions if there's clarification I can give. And then the organizations following me will help clarify as well. Are there any questions for Representative Fluker? All right, seeing none, I don't believe anybody from the department was, was going to testify on this bill at the moment. Uh, they did submit written testimony. If I am incorrect on that, I'm sure. I think Nancy McBrady is out in the waiting room if we had questions, but it, uh, I don't think she was going to testify. So the next three people that I have to testify on this bill is Abby Farnham, Allison Perrin Drag, and James DeBasey. So if we could let those three in, please, Cheryl, if they're there. And we'll start with Abby Farnham. Hello. Good afternoon, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Abby Farnham, and I'm here today on behalf of Maine Farmland Trust, MFT, to speak in support of LB 691, an act to support farms and address food insecurity, but to ask that the bill be held over to the 2022 legislative session. MFT is a member-powered statewide organization that works to protect farmland, support farmers, and advance the future of farming. We have been operating a nutrition incentive program since we first we were first awarded a federal food insecurity nutrition incentive grant from the USDA in 2015. Our program, Farm Fresh Rewards, doubles supplemental nutrition assistance program benefits or SNAP spent on local food at retail stores. For every $5 a customer using SNAP spends on any local foods, including dairy, eggs, poultry, maple syrup, et cetera, the customer receives a $5 bonus voucher to purchase additional main grown fruits and vegetables. The store network, which we hope to uh, grow this spring, sources a wide variety of products from over 400 main farms each year. Nutrition incentive programs in Maine and across the country have experienced significant growth during the coronavirus pandemic. Throughout 2020, Farm Fresh Rewards customers earned over $162,000 in incentives by purchasing Maine produced food with SNAP, and customers redeemed over $158,000 in incentives for Maine grown fruit and vegetables. This is a more than 20% increase from 2019. Therefore, in 2020 alone, this program contributed to at least $320,000 in Maine's local food economy. While program growth provides an important source of support for local farms and Mainers who are struggling with food insecurity, this growth also comes with challenges. The federal funding that supports these programs requires matching contributions on a dollar for dollar basis. So as participation in these programs grows, so does the need to secure matching funds from non-federal sources. The fund established by LD 691 would create a consistent source of statewide funding that could enable the programs to grow and thrive, including expanding further into rural areas that need more administrative support. At the same time, statewide funding would provide a critical source of matching funds and help bring more federal dollars into the state. During the last legislature, a private foundation offered to make a $100,000 matching contribution to LD 691's predecessor legislation with the aim of incentivizing a state appropriation to the fund. This contribution is no longer a possibility due to extensive pandemic-related grant making on the part of this foundation. MFT and our 
partners would like to take 2021 to pursue other opportunities to establish a matching contribution from a foundation, creating the potential for a public private partnership that could in turn leverage additional federal dollars, all in support of Maine's low-income families and local food and farm businesses. We would also like to see how the influx of federal stimulus funds to the state through the American Rescue Plan will impact the opportunity for the fund to receive a state appropriation in 2022. For these reasons, we hope that you will support the request to carry over LD 691 to the 2022 legislative session. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any questions? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to Allison Perrin Drag. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and committee members. My name is Allison Perrin Drag. I'm with the American Heart Association. The American Heart Association is the nation's oldest and largest voluntary organization dedicated to fighting heart disease and stroke, whose mission is to be a relentless force for a world of, of longer, healthier lives. We are testifying in support of LD 691. Across the United States, many families and individuals struggle with food insecurity. The Supplemental Nutrition Program, or SNAP, is the nation's largest nutrition assistance program, providing monthly benefits to more than 44 million people living in the United States. SNAP helps millions of low-income individuals and families each year. In fact, more than one in 10 families in the United States rely on SNAP benefits each month. And the reality is that two thirds of SNAP participants are children, the elderly, and people with disabilities. One key strategy to make a healthy diet more affordable and accessible for SNAP recipients is to provide produce incentives. Generally in these programs, shoppers use SNAP benefits to purchase incentivized healthy products, then receive a matching amount to purchase additional fruits and vegetables. Since 2005, numerous local and state governments have provided funding for SNAP produce incentive programs, mostly at farmer's markets. By adding financial incentives to encourage SNAP participants to purchase more fruits and vegetables, these families and individuals can improve their diets overall. SNAP incentive programs help families stretch their food dollars and buy healthier options, which means that children are taught healthy behaviors and establish lifelong habits that will support their overall health and wellness. SNAP incentives ensure that participants have greater access to nutritious foods and help to encourage them to purchase more fruits and vegetables. Without SNAP incentives, thousands of families would not be able to afford fruits and vegetables for their kids. Every $5 spent using SNAP generates as much as $9 in economic activity. SNAP incentives have had a direct impact on revenue for local merchants, especially farmers. According to the USDA's Economic Research Service, each $1 billion of retail generated by SNAP creates $340 million in farm production, $110 million in farm value added, and 3,300 farm jobs. Data has shown that SNAP households have purchased more than half a million dollars in produce, and 62% of participants purchased more fruits and vegetables. Studies have found that incentives may lead to longer-term behavior change, and a 2013 study found that participants who received a 50% discount on fruits and vegetables purchased more than three times as much, which translates into 50% more fruits and vegetables than those who did not receive the discount. SNAP incentives can increase low-income shoppers' use of farmers' markets. We feel strongly that Maine needs to invest the necessary funds to add these financial incentives to all SNAP par participants can purchase more fruits and vegetables. We are supportive of the program, but are, are concerned that $50,000 would not be enough funding to see these positive results. We would love to see Maine invest at least a million dollars so that people have adequate access. We believe that a well-funded incentive program can drive economic growth for local farms and businesses and build a healthier community. Thank you so much. Perfect time. <laughs> Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next is James DeBasey, if I'm pronouncing your name somewhat near correctly. <laughs> Good afternoon, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Jimmy DiBiase. DiBiase. All there right. <laughs> Close enough. I'm a resident of Freeport, and I'm here today on behalf of the Maine Federation of Farmers Markets, MFFM, to speak in support of LD 691, an act to support farms and address food insecurity. Like our partners, we're going to ask that this bill be held over to the 2022 legislative session. MFFM is a grassroots statewide organization founded by market farmers back in 1991. Our mission is to cultivate a vibrant, sustainable farmers market community as a vital part of Maine's local food network. 
MFFM administers the Maine Harvest Bucks program, a program that ensures that farmers selling direct to consumer have access to one eighth of Maine's population that participate in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, known as SNAP. LD691, as you all know, will establish a state fund to support programs like Maine Harvest Bucks. This state fund is vitally important to the short term and long term sustainability of our program. State support is a common and necessary step in the maturation of programs like Maine Harvest Bucks, and it has been established with bipartisan support in other, um, other states across the country. In Maine, Maine Harvest Bucks is available at 33 farmers markets as of 2020, um, from Kittery to Farmington, B Bangor, Ellsworth, Holton, and Presque Isle. At farmers markets, when somebody spends a dollar with SNAP, they receive one do dollar in bonus bucks to spend on local fruits and vegetables. Maine Harvest Bucks is available at over 60 direct to consumer market outlets, including farmers markets, farm stands, CSAs, mobile farm stands, um, and even the good food bus in Lewiston, Auburn. Uh, and it represents, or it ben it's to the benefit of over 400 farmers at those locations. Since 2015, more than $1 million in SNAP and Maine Harvest Bucks has been spent at farmers markets alone. In 2020, during the pandemic, we saw a $90,000 jump in SNAP sales, over 66% growth in, from 2019. In total for 2020, at farmers market CSAs and mobile markets, over a half million dollars was spent in SNAP and bonus bucks directly with Maine farmers. MHB, Maine Harvest Bucks, obviously um, boosts farmers' sales and improves the viability of entire farmers' markets and communities across Maine. At the Mill Park Farmers Market in Augusta, some vendors report that over a quarter of their sales come from SNAP and Maine Harvest Bucks on cer certain days. With nutrition incentive program, programming like Maine Harvest Bucks, uh, we gain, farmers gain new customers, increase their sales, and more SNAP dollars are kept in the local economy. We also did a, a recent survey with over 70 SNAP shoppers um, per, that use the Harvest Bucks program. And we learned that two thirds of the survey respondents have participated in the emergency food system this past year at pantries, food boxes, or soup kitchen. 55% um, of participants claim that they learned to cook healthier foods because of Maine Harvest Bucks. We also learned that if our program were to shrink or close that 62% would buy less healthy food. A quarter would rely on pantries more often. 11% may have to rely on pantries for the first time and nearly two thirds of participants would not be able to shop at farmer's markets anymore. The federal funding that supports nutrition incentive programs in Maine requires non-federal matching contributions on a dollar for dollar basis. As participation in these programs grow, so does the need to secure matching funds from non-federal sources. State funds will help provide a source of support for outreach and administrative expenses needed to sustain our program and expand it to more rural parts of the state. My, my remaining points have been said by my colleagues, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, again, thank you for your testimony. Thank you all. And that's all I have. Is there anyone else for 691? Nope, okay. So I will close the hearing on LD 691 and we'll move on to our last. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Did Would you want to move into work session and carry this over at this point? Or if you want more conversation, happy to do that as well. I don't see that we need to have any more conversation on it if that's your wish too. You're the uh, main sponsor here. Uh, then I don't know if we need to suspend the rules, but I would move the rules <laughs> to, <laughs> to uh, move directly into work session for the purpose of carrying this over. All right, is there a second? It's been seconded by Representative Landry. All in favor, raise your hand. Thank you, we're in work session on LD, is that 691? Yes, on 691. Is there a motion out there? I'm happy to do it. Sure. I move to carry this over to next session, LD 691. It's been moved by Representative Pluka to carry the bill over. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Bernard. Any discussion? Seeing none, Cheryl, would you please call the roll?
Can't hear you, Cheryl. Can't hear me at all. <laughs> there you <I> go. Repeat. <laughs> LG 691, the Act to Support Farms and Address Food Insecurity, carryover to 2022. Uh, Lori, Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Absent. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill, yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford. Yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, yes. Representative David McCray. Yes. Representative David McCray, yes. Representative Susan Bernard. Yes. Representative Susan Bernard, yes. 12 yes, one absent. On LD 691, an act to support farms and address food security. It was a 12 0 1 vote to carry the bill over. We will carry the bill over. And next we have LD 700. And what? Yes, LD 700, an act to promote economic development and outdoor recreation through investment in state parks. To present the bill as Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, Senator Dill and fellow members of the ACF committee. I am Maggie O'Neill um, from Saco, and I am pleased to present LD 700, which is an act to promote economic development and outdoor recreation through investment in state parks. This bill um, offers an opportunity to create an ongoing source of funding for much needed investments in one of Maine's most precious assets, which is our state park system. I am bringing it forward at a time when more Mainers and visitors than ever are interested in what our state parks have to offer. As this committee knows, the Bureau of Parks and Lands manages 48 state parks and historic sites across the state. From the 92 mile Allagash Wilderness Waterway to Fort McCleary and Kittery, um, and from Grafton Notch um, to Quaddy Head with its iconic striped lighthouse. Our parks and historic sites are gems and they offer a wide range of experiences. At state parks, you can dig a peck of clams, you can navigate um, class two rapids, or you can summon a mountain. You might see a moose or a whale, hear a loon, um, catch a brook trout or a striper, um, if you and your family have told stories around a campfire, picnicked in a beautiful place, or cooled off on a hot day, you know that these state parks are places where um, memories are made. For the first time ever in 2020, we had more than 3 million visitors visit our parks, setting a new record. Especially during the pandemic, our park visitors sought beauty and solace, places to connect safely with friends and families, and an affordable place to relax and recharge. Um, visitors also um, bought sunscreen and bug spray, gasoline and propane, um, coolers, beach for lunch, contributing more than 100 million to our economy. As former State Parks employees, Rep uh, Representative Schofield and I can tell you that in return for a relatively modest fee, visitors get a great experience. They meet friendly staff, um, they have clean bathrooms and a chance to be outside in a beautiful place. The Bureau of Parks and Lands prides itself on providing a great experience at an accessible cost as it has for more than 85 years. While the scenery um, in our parks is you know, beautiful, the infrastructure is showing its age. All infrastructure requires investment from time to time and sites that greet more than 3 million people in a year see a lot of wear and tear. While dedicated staff have made the best of limited resources for years, 
the parks have received only sporadic capital investment, resulting in an estimated um, 50 million maintenance back backlog. LD700 is just one tool to create an ongoing source of funding for maintenance needs. So here's what the bill would do. The bill would cap the amount of money directed um, to the general fund from state park entrance fees at 4.5 million. And it would allow any revenue that's above that amount to accrue in a non-lapsing account for the purposes of reinvesting in capital. The need is great and it includes um, crumbling roads and parking lots, deteriorating boathouses and other structures, inadequate staff housing, and um, numerous structures that are out of compliance with the ADA. To be clear, any revenue LD700 would produce um, wouldn't be a substitute for the much, much needed larger capital investments that um, a bond question could support, but having an ongoing source of funding for capital repairs would help to prevent the kind of backlog of structural deterioration that we're facing right now. Importantly, um, it could be used as a match to draw down federal land and water conservation fund dollars, meaning that our state monies could go further. Millions of Americans have taken up outdoor activities in the past year. As the pandemic eases and travel restrictions, um, you know, are eventually li lifted, people are going to have a choice about where they go to enjoy their time and spend their tourism dollars. Visitors from Southern New England make up the majority of our tourists, but they can travel to Vermont, New Hampshire, or Canada as easily as they can to me. We would be wise to invest in our state parks and historic sites to ensure that we can um, continue to offer a top-notch experience, meet the, um, meet the expectations of today's visitors. So I hope you'll join me in helping to make that possible by supporting LD700. Thank you, and I look forward to working with you on this important challenge. Are there any questions for Representative O'Neill? Seeing none, are any, any other legislators here that want to testify? Representative Schofield, is it a question? You're going to testify. I will just uh, testify. I don't have anything written, Senator Dill, but sure. good, uh, good, more, good afternoon, uh, Senator Dill and Representative O'Neill and esteemed members and colleagues on this committee. I just wanted to say that uh, I fully support this, this, uh, this approach. It, uh, I can tell you my 43 year career with the Park Service, we, we had a, a ton of stuff that just got deferred and deferred and deferred. I'll give you a couple of examples. The last time the, the entrance road to Sebago Lake State Park, Maine's heaviest used state park facility in the system. Uh, roughly 45% of all camping that goes on in Maine State Parks occurs at Sebago Lake State Park. The last time that road was paved was 1970. That was over 50 years ago, 50 years since that road has been paved. The day area has a new one. The, the road into the day use area at Sebago Lake State Park, again, one of the top three or four heaviest used state parks in the system. That was done more recently. That was done in 1978. So uh, <clears throat> that's only 43 years old. Uh, those are just a couple of quick examples of the types of infrastructure that just has been deferred over time. I tell people, you go to a state park, it looks beautiful. It looks wonderful. It's, it's got all kinds of pleasant uh, features to it. But what you don't see and what costs a lot and what is very important is underground, sewer systems, water systems, uh, all of those things are, are important. I can remember, I can remember back in the 80s, we had a we had a, a, a statewide, a statewide from Fort Kent to Kittery, we had a statewide repair budget of $19,000, 19,000 bucks. That was in the 1980s. If you and we had we had a sewer pump go at one of our major facilities, which chewed up about one third of our entire repair budget for the entire park system. And it's real easy to uh, to oh, look at our good. parks and think of how thank wonderful you. they are. You and it's real easy to to think that everything's just hunky dory. 
but there's a lot that goes on under the under the surface that that people just don't realize and uh, we do we see it we know it and we are patching it up I, I know of several I know of several instances where water lines probably have more patches than they do actual original line so this is important and real quick I'm going to wrap up here the uh, the bill number LD700, I think is kind of neat. When I was with the Park Service, the license plate on my state vehicle was 007. I was the original 007 prior to Roger Moore and all those other guys. So I just wanted to throw that out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Representative McRae, you have a question? For Representative uh, no, I don't. I, I would just like to jump in and, and testify a little bit. I have nowhere near the institutional knowledge that uh, the good Representative Schofield has, but he, he very eloquently, especially for a guy that didn't have a written testimony ready, uh, uh, he, he emphasized the point I wish to make. There's no question. I, nobody will question that these state parks are in dire need of infrastructure updates. Uh, that's an absolute fact. It just seems to me that this bill is the perfect way to approach it without really breaking the bank and, and doing what we need to do. So I just want to throw that in. Thank you. All right, thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative McCray, does Desi like the bill too? I'm not, even gonna tell him. I'm not even going to tell him he's muted, so. so we'll move on. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, uh, next is Andy Cutco, Director Cutco. Do you want to unmute yourself, introduce yourself, sir? We'll, we'll move forward. Thank you. I don't even have any dogs to worry about here. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and honorable members of the committee. I'm Andy Cutco. I'm the director of the Bureau of Parks and Lands. Uh, thanks for your stamina and uh, a little bit of levity today, so I appreciate that. Um, before I comment on 700, I want to just comment very briefly on 728, uh, which was Senator Black's bill regarding information on public lands and hunters. Uh, I actually had prepared testimony on that one that didn't make it into the queue, but uh, in light of the motion, I'll just say the Bureau is in full support uh, of Senator Black's motion. In addition to hiking and biking and paddling on public lands, I also hunt and fish, so I appreciate the interest uh, in improved information. And we have had good discussions with IFNW and the Sportsman's Alliance of, of Maine on, on that issue. So uh, we're in full support of, of where you ended up with on uh, 728. Uh, in terms of 700, I'm speaking in support of it on behalf of the department, and I want to thank uh, Representatives O'Neill and Schofield uh, for sponsoring the bill. Uh, as you've heard, the bill would create a dedicated non-lapsing account to be used for capital improvements and maintenance for Maine State Parks. Uh, currently, the state parks receive a biennial allocation from the general fund, and while that amount covers basic annual operations, it doesn't begin to address the estimated uh, $50 million backlog in maintenance and infrastructure needs. Uh, the department has submitted to the committee a document that provides additional detail on both the value and the needs of the state park system, including the estimated $100 million contribution uh, of the state park system to Maine's economy. The legislation is particularly timely for a couple of reasons. First, uh, as you know, the state parks had an all-time attendance record last year exceeding the 3 million visitation mark for the first time ever. And I will say that my own family uh, contributed to those numbers. We camped at four different state park campgrounds last summer. Uh, and all indications point to another incredible year in 2021. Uh, on the opening day of state park reservations this year, the Bureau of Parks and Lands in Inform Me processed 3,234 transactions in the first hour uh, which represents a 75% increase since last year. Uh, and these opening day transactions in included, included an astonishing 149 transactions in just one minute. Uh, and through mid-March of this year, the Bureau had booked more than uh, 10,300 campground reservations, which was 66% more, uh, 66 more than at that time last year. 
In addition to our record uh, year in 2020, another significant development last year was the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act. This federal legislation will result in an increase, uh, a potential doubling in fact, of the federal funds available for state parks through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund requires a 50% state or local match and LD700 could generate important state park funding that could serve as LWCF match. Uh, as you've heard, the dedicated account created uh, by the LD700 would allocate any uh, annual revenue over 4.5 million to that account. Uh, 4.5 million is actually the average annual state park revenue over the last decade. Uh, the fiscal impact of this bill will depend on the amount of revenue generated. Uh, but as the committee considers the fiscal impact, recognize that these dedicated funds would be directed towards restoring fundamental state-owned infrastructure. In short, LD700 would create a most welcome vehicle to support the ongoing maintenance and improvement of Maine State Parks, uh, as we have seen a progressive growth in visitation through the years and also at this moment when interest in and use of our parks is surging. Thanks for your thoughtful consideration of these issues and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Are there any questions for the director? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next we have, let's see, we have two other folks on my list, Eliza Townsend and Melanie Stern. So with that, Eliza. Good afternoon, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, distinguished members of the ACF committee. I am Eliza Townsend. I'm the main conservation policy director for the Appalachian Mountain Club. And I'm pleased to address you today in support of LD700. AMC is the nation's oldest conservation, recreation, and education organization with the mission to foster the protection, enjoyment, and understanding of the outdoors. We've had a strong interest in outdoor recreation since our founding in 1876 as a group dedicated to adventuring and exploring. Everyone needs to get outside to enjoy fresh air, to relax, to clear our heads, to enjoy scenery and to connect with nature, to cool off, to be physically active, or just to sit and read and think. Located throughout our state, the state parks make that opportunity available to everyone at a low cost, truly their special places. More people know that today than just a year ago. In 2020, a record 3 million people turned to them as they sought to relieve stress or connect safely with friends and family or to vacation in a budget conscious way. Camping in particular surged across the system by 20% at Lemoyne State Park, 31% at Mount Blue, 37% at Cops Cook, and a whopping 45% at a rustic state park. This rediscovery of the benefits of outdoor recreation is wonderful. It has sparked unprecedented sales of outdoor equipment. Perhaps you saw this morning's headline about the, the difficulty people are having getting bicycles as a result of the pandemic. And it has brought more money into the state coffers in the form of park entrance fees and sales taxes. We can hope that it has fundamentally changed life habits for many reconnecting them to nature and spurring increased physical activity. And again, another headline has recently indicated that being around wildlife and in particular spotting birds causes people as much happiness as money. In a February article, several new residents told the Bangor Daily News that access to outdoor activities was a factor in their decision to relocate to Maine. At the same time, the surge of use has put new pressures on infrastructure that has been sorely in need of repair or replacement for a long time. The last sizable investment in the parks was more than a decade ago, and a backlog of about 50 million of needed repairs has accumulated. Challenges range from facilities that are out of date to unsightly damaged and leaking buildings to major safety concerns. We can and must do better. Investing in our state parks is first and foremost a matter of public safety, and it is our responsibility. In addition, it will improve visitor experience, make the parks more welcoming to people of all ages and abilities, and provide for better working conditions for staff. Investing in our state parks will demonstrate self-respect and regard for all users. The considerable resources Maine will see from the American Rescue Act should be invested in the, in the parks, which is exciting. 
Nevertheless, we should take steps to ensure that they are never so neglected again. By passing LD700, we can create an ongoing source of funding for maintenance. A model exists in the non-lapsing account established to assist the Maine Forest Service to replace its aging fleet of aircraft. I urge the committee to pass LD700 and I would be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? All right, thank you for your testimony. Next is Melanie Sturm. Good afternoon, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill and members of the committee. I'm Melanie Sturm, the Forest and Wildlife Director at the Natural Resources Council of Maine, and I'm providing testimony in support of LD 700. Maine State Parks are in critical need of investment, as you've heard. They face $50 million of deferred maintenance that has accrued over years of being underfunded. LD 700 would help the Bureau of Parks and Lands start to chip away at that large backlog by setting aside funds for things like sewer systems, roads, and accessibility issues. For years, Maine State Parks have provided positive experiences for millions of visitors annually on a slim budget, but that way of operating is not sustainable, especially when our state parks are more popular than ever. In 2020, Maine State Parks had a record-breaking year, surpassing 3 million visitors, and 2021 is on track to be just as busy as Director Cutco said, if campground reservations are any indication. This is a testament to the important role of state parks to Maine residents and visitors. Even during non-pandemic times, Maine's parks are a centerpiece of Maine's outdoor recreation and tourism economy. They also provide wildlife habitat and other ecosystem services, which themselves have immense value ecologically and economically. <laughs> The last time Maine State Parks received bond funding for capital improvements was in 2010, and any funding that has been made available in the interim has only been for minor updates. In 2019, the Land Conservation Task Force called for, quote, creating a dedicated source of revenue to address ongoing capital needs, unquote. This bill would help accomplish that by creating a non-lapsing fund for state parks that would receive revenue in excess of $4.5 million. These funds would be allowed to be used as match for, for federal dollars from the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which provides grants to state and local governments for the acquisition and development of public outdoor recreation areas and facilities. If Maine does not invest in basic infrastructure and facility improvements at state parks, we stand to lose our competitive advantage over other non-New England states, excuse me, no matter how spectacular Maine's natural resources and landscape features are, as we know they are. Without investment, over time, state parks will not be as popular or meet the new and evolving outdoor recreation interests of the public, potentially causing visitation and revenue to decline. We need a solution like the one offered in LD700 to the growing maintenance backlog at Maine State Parks. The contributions of state parks to Maine are significant, so we respectfully urge the committee to vote ought to pass on LD700. Thank you for your time and consideration of the issue, and I would be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions? Seeing none. All right, uh, Cheryl, I think that's all I have on the list. Is there anyone that I'm missing? Nope. Okay, with that, I will close the hearing on LD 700, and that concludes our hearings for today. Cheryl or Karen, is there anything to come before us? Do you have any language reviews or anything like that? Fiscal notes? Any of that good stuff? No, but is there a letter you want to discuss, Representative O'Neill, Senator Black? You alluded to it on Tuesday, I believe. Yeah, thank you for the prompting, um, Karen. Um, did you circulate it for? To take a look. Sure, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. I'm I can sorry. screen share it or I can email it. I can do both. I, I, I um, wasn't sure. I wasn't sure where Senator Black was um, on the letter, but I can screen share the latest version that I have. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of folks had seen and okayed it, so. Let's 
So I don't, do you, do you want to read through it or how, how do you want to proceed? Um, I think sending it out is okay. I don't think you necessarily have to read the, it's like three pages or two and a half or something. Okay. I don't know if folks want to take a look before locating it or not, but um, if folks are okay with it, um, I would just ask that we send it out um, Monday afternoon, please. So are you asking for us to vote on this, uh, Representative? Um, I don't know procedure wise. I mean, we may as well. I, I think. So, do you want to take a minute and let people read this so you can do it now? Otherwise, we won't have a chance until who knows when and when we're back together to vote on it if we don't if you don't do it now. So. Um, yes, that sounds perfect. Yeah, it can take two Representative minutes. Schofield. I was just going to suggest that I am fine with it. And just what you just suggested, Senator Dill, that we take a couple of minutes and review it for those who haven't had the opportunity. Uh, I just want to say that I'm fine with it. Okay. Why don't we uh, Why don't we take five minutes and read it, and then we'll get back, Senator Black. Senator. Uh, yeah, I, I well, I, I think it would be good if we could, you know, vote it out today. Uh, I think some people have had it emailed out to them and had a chance to look at it, so um, I don't think it's very controversial, but. Uh, um, the, the, uh, take five minutes and look at it and, and try to vote it out would be my suggestion. Okay, we'll, we'll take a few minutes and yes, Karen. Just um, just a reminder, you already have voted um, in favor of this letter. I guess it's kind of like just finalizing the version, although um, there was member one member who was absent at the time of the vote, Representative Gifford, I believe. So he would be the one that, you know, I'd have to, if he hasn't had an opportunity to review it, then I could include him um, in the vote and amend that part of the letter, which uh, does uh, make reference to the 11, one, uh, 11 in favor, one opposed and one absent. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, that works for me. I was trying to think of whether we would redo it or give him a chance to vote or I don't know the procedure. Yeah, I'd love for Gifford to have the chance to participate. Thank you. I would like a, a chance to read that. Representative Gifford, do you have, uh, did you just get the email that has it uh, so you can read it? I believe I did. We'll give you a couple minutes if you'd like to look it over. Sounds good. I'll do that. All right. Representative Landry. Is there any way she could screen share it? Sometimes it takes me 10 or 15 minutes to get an email once it's sent. Okay, sure. Um, Karen, would you screen share it? That way everybody can read it on the screen, I guess. That might be the quickest way anyway. Thank you. Representative Dill, would it be helpful if you just read the thing? Uh, I know it'll take a couple minutes, but by the time, if you could just read that, I would appreciate it. Sure, she can pop it up there. Or I can find it. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'll, in this sense, this is Representative O'Neill's and Senator Black's letter. I will let Representative O'Neill read it. Yeah, I was just going to offer to do that. And I can give you, I think, the shorter version of it. Um, uh, so basically what the letter does is it goes over, um, gives a little bit of history. It talks about what we did um, last term in the 129th with... Um, I think it was 1893. Um, so it says that last time around, um, 
unanimously, we um, kind of made a determination as a committee that there was a substantial alteration and, um, and it cites to, you know, the, the constitution and, and just a little bit of the history. Um, it talks about um, testimony that um, Director Cutco made um, and just that we would have expected um, based on that testimony, um, transparency, being involved in the process as a legislature and that because we had communicated so clearly um, that we thought it was a substantial alteration, we would have expected for it to come back to us for a review. And um, it includes um, the finding from, um, from that bill last session where we laid it all out in the resolve um, saying that it was a substantial alteration. So that's the italic part that's set aside. And um, yeah, I already covered what's in that paragraph with the red there. So, um, so really it's, um, if I could say it in one sentence, it gave our history on the matter and um, it restates that the corridor project is a substantial alteration and that the legislature should have had a chance to, um, to vote on it. Go ahead, Representative O'Neill. Ball's in your court on this one. Is everybody all set to, do you feel like you've had enough time to look it over? Okay. Um, so are we are we re-voting to give Representative Gifford that a would chance be, to vote? Aaron, do we need to reconsider the votes uh, to let him vote? I mean, we still have- I see that now we have a different person absent, so I don't know what that right. means. Because he had voted, a, he may have been the one who voted against it. I don't remember, so. No, it was Representative no, it was, Bernard. Oh, it's Representative uh, Bernard. Okay. Yeah, so um, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's not a bill. It's, I don't think it's necessary to reconsider, um, but if Representative Gifford wants to weigh in um, you one way or another. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I would, and I, I would vote in the affirmative. Okay. okay. So I guess that means uh, Maggie, uh, excuse me, Representative O'Neill. Oh, so um, just since we've already taken the vote and this is a review, um, all that I would direct um, to Karen is, could you please send this letter out um, to the commissioner and um, Director Cutco Monday afternoon? With the change in the vote. Yes, please. Yeah, with the change with, that we just discussed with the vote and the text. And if that works for us Monday afternoon. Mr. Mr. Okay, so not before Monday? Um, Is there a reason for the timing? Um, I ju it just was something we had agreed on, but yeah. Okay, so you want me to wait a few days before I send it? Yes, please, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Mr. Chairman. Senator Black. I would confer with uh, Representative O'Neill that I I'd like to have it sent out on Monday afternoon if possible. Okay, thank you. And I, and I do wanna thank uh, Representative Schofield for his confidence in my reading ability, but uh, uh, I did uh, pass on that. Uh, anything else anyone has before I ask for motion to adjourn? Representative Bernard. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure that I got in my vote uh, for LD 728. Oh, today? If I can do that yep. before we... Yep. Thank you. Um, I'd like to vote ought not to pass. I don't know if that's a yes or a no, but ought not to pass. Okay. 
And there was a carryover one. Did you vote on the carryover? Not that it really I did. Not. Okay. I did. Okay. Anything else to come before us? So I guess the next time uh, that we'll be meeting, we think, is um, April Fool's Day at 9 a.m., April 1st. Yep, sounds like it. Senator McRae, I saw your hand flip up yes. there for a second. I, I would just like to say that I'm going to have to leave by 1.15. <laughs> yep, I think I think we're all done. <laughs> I know. I the kids Thank you for all of that. A little bit, but uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? I will move to adjourn, Senator Dill. It's been moved by Senator Schofield. Is uh, Representative Schofield is a second? No one wants to adjourn. Representative McRae, all in favor? Raise your hand. Thank you. Go to folks. See you See all. April Fools. If not before. <laughs>